Bits of news on this important story. The Canada-U.S. border is effectively shutting down. Donald Trump tweeting this morning that, by mutual consent, all non-essential travel between the two countries will cease. We are waiting to hear from the Prime Minister on this and details of a new aid package, a massive one, that will help Canadians financially survive this pandemic. Here we are in the nation's capital. Uh, obviously, par Parliament's not happening right now, but any moment the Prime Minister is expected to address the country once again, once again from outside his home uh, at Rideau Cottage, where he has been self-isolating now for almost a week with his family after his wife tested positive for COVID-19. We'll be listening closely, obviously, for details about that temporarily temporary closure of the Canada-U.S. border that we reported last night and the president confirmed a few moments ago. Remember, uh, the details that we have so far on that border closure, an extraordinary measure, the like of which we haven't seen since 9-11, the last time the border was uh, deeply affected by restricted access, um, is that non-essential travel uh, will be uh, no longer allowed, but that goods and trade uh, across that border, which of course is a huge source of of economic importance and to our even livelihood will continue. Not clear on exactly how that's going to work, so hopefully we'll hear more from the Prime Minister about all of that. We're also waiting to hear uh, at around 11.15 or so the details of that $25 billion financial aid package. That, of course, something that the government signaled last week after making uh, more credit available to the economic system uh, writ large in this country. Uh, it comes also on the day when Canada's six major banks say that they will uh, now allow for mortgage payment deferrals for up to six months. But the measures we are expecting today are really to target uh, Canadians individually and families who are going to feel the impact of this or are already feeling it as some businesses begin to shut down. Let me give you an example. Today, for example, well, Porter Airlines says that as of Friday, it will no longer uh, be conducting any business, at least until June 1st. Porter flies through uh, most of eastern Canada and into eastern United States. If the border is temporarily closed, Porter doesn't really have a reason to go on. And so you would imagine that even those people, Porter employees, will be uh, needing some financial help in the days and weeks ahead. As we wait for the Prime Minister, let's bring in Vashi Capellas, the host of Power and Politics, watching developments closely here in Ottawa. So uh, we saw last week, Vashi, um, the, the finance minister, the governor of the Bank of Canada, the superintendent of financial institutions, have this like really rare uh, and remarkable mm -hmm. press conference where the three of them came together with some concerted action, a rate cut, uh, making billions of dollars available to businesses and making sure there was some more liquidity in banks. That was sort of the underpinnings of, of what the government needed to do to make sure the economy was, was moving. Uh, today is a little different, much more targeted towards people and probably the stuff that people need to hear more directly today. Yeah, I'd imagine so. And what's so interesting as you were laying that out, Rosie, I was thinking back to Friday and how it seems like an eternity ago and how <laughs> when they made the announcement of $10 billion for small business loans or in credit for small businesses, it seemed like a lot of money. And, and just, you know, six days later, five days later, the need has grown exponentially as the number of cases of this virus start to grow nearly exponentially as well. And so I think you're absolutely right. Today what we are expecting is the question, an answer or at least part of an answer to a question we know so many Canadians have. And that is, if I have to stay home because I am sick, because I have this virus, or just because I'm not feeling well, or because the message from the federal government right now is unless you're you essentially, like it's essential that you get out of your house to go to work, you should be staying inside. Or if I own a small business and I can't pay my employees, like all of those questions we're expecting some sort of an answer to. I think we need, I think Canadians need to hear as much as possible from the government about mm -hmm. what this 25 to $30 billion aid package or stimulus package actually means for them. We do know, and the, the United States has signaled this as well, that some form of direct payments to Canadians who are in need, especially 
especially for those who at this moment are wondering how they're going to pay the rent in a few weeks or how they're going to pay for groceries or meet their bills, pay, pay for utilities, that kind of thing. Some sort of direct help through, it sounds like, programs that are already in existence like the child benefit or through the tax system that's set up. Uh, we're expecting something on that. So how will they get that money to you? I think that's a big concern. And then speaking of taxes, it sounds like we might also get a deferral. There's a little bit mm -hmm, of mixed messaging, mm -hmm. but it sounds like the Prime Minister had indicated maybe that announcement was coming later this week, but there's some reports that it might come today that there will be a deferral, like a delay in the tax filing deadline, which of course was coming up at the end uh, uh, very soon, actually. Mm -hmm. So so those are things I think people are, and especially businesses right now, are counting on some information uh, on, and I think that is the expectation for the press conference from the Prime Minister today. I mean, such such remarkable times, you know, and I, I, I say that again and again, but, but it is so unusual how much is happening, how much has happened over a short period of time, and how the government is responding and really being significantly tested uh, in terms of how it deals with this. I mean, I, I don't know how many different uh, times you and I and, and others have talked about the number of crises that have hit the government since January as it began its first minority mandate, whether it be the downing of that Ukrainian plane in Iraq uh, the ongoing blockades around the LNG. Those stories seem like so long ago. And yeah. COVID-19 is really now all-encompassing for the country and, and for the government as it is, you know, feeling the pressure of something that others are, that we're all experiencing worldwide. Yeah, and it's interesting, Rosie, because you... It's funny, we have talked so often since January about those other crises, and they were significant and, and devastating in, sure. in so many respects. But almost incomparable to, to what's going on right now. This is, uh, this, this is when I think for many Canadians, the idea of government and the role of government takes on a completely different meaning. Oh, there's always a debate sort of, you know, should, should government be in your life, should they not? And that's a very valid de debate to have in normal circumstances, but the, these are anything but, this is anything but a normal circumstance. And so I think you're right to say, obviously they are completely consumed with this. And I think Canadians are consumed with trying to figure out how their mm -hmm. government will address the problems that they are beginning to feel and beginning to face, but will only sort of not get worse, but get, you know, multiply, basically. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. again, thinking back just a week when so many people were saying, should I go away, should I not? And a week later being told, you need to get home right now. That's how fast all of this is changing. That's how fast the, the, the needs of Canadians are changing. And so the government, not only in its sort of central role, will be tested, but in its ability to respond to those yep. needs. Yep. And that is going to be a monumental challenge. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and again, you know, hard to judge whether the good decisions or bad decisions are being made. All we can do is sort of ask them to explain why they're being For made sure. and, and hope we can understand at a later date uh, whether things you know, we're right or wrong. Uh, okay, Vashi, I'm just going to put you on standby for a moment as I go to CBC's David Cochran. Uh, I, I want to talk to you, David, about uh, part of the news that you broke last night around the temporary border closure. Uh, the president confirming today that, that that is indeed going to happen, but he says that trade will not be affected. Um, I, I guess I have lots of questions about how <laughs> this is going to work, yeah. and I don't think we have many answers at this stage. No, Rosie, like you, everything is, you know, like you, I live here now, and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. everything is changing massively. I, I mean, I don't want to overstate this, but it's almost like we are imposing wartime measures and getting on a wartime footing to defeat a viral enemy. Yep. You know, with the government taking enormous action to ramp up resources to keep people safe and protect people as best they can, while asking all of us to make enormous sacrifices in our daily lives to keep each other safe. I, I mean, maybe it's a little bit simplistic, but when you look at the restrictions on border and commerce and travel and public movement and large scale gatherings and the ability to work freely, it, it, it's truly an unprecedented peacetime situation uh, in Canada. And, and, and yesterday, what we heard from the prime minister was, this is what we need you to do. And today we're going to hear from the government, this is what we will do to help you as you are doing those things. And, and to highlight one of what Vashi was saying earlier, the process is like the big message comes from the prime minister and then the mechanics come from the ministers, like the implementation and the nitty gritty right. of how it's going to work. But he has this role of convincing everybody 
to follow the public health advice, reassure everybody in a time of great anxiety and worry. I know all of us, you know, even though we're coming into work, we're all dealing with this too, is we all have families and kids and things like that that we're all worried about. And then also give some hope of, of, of what it's gonna be like coming out on the other side of this. And, and that's what you're seeing in a lot of the messaging, that we're gonna pull together, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna have a plan to rebound a, as, as quickly as possible. The border measures, with the U.S. took a longer period of time than the border measures with the rest of the yeah. world. I'm okay. going to stop talking because the Prime Minister is yeah. walking. all right. And here right. is the Prime Minister coming to the podium to address Canadians again from outside his home. Let's listen to him now. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. Merci d'être des nôtres. Before we get into things, I have some news to share regarding the Canada-U.S. border. Over the past few days, I've spoken to President Trump about what we can do to slow the spread of COVID-19. Deputy Prime Minister Freeland has been in touch with Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompeo. I just spoke to President Trump again this morning, and we have agreed that both Canada and the United States will temporarily restrict all non-essential travel across the Canada-US border. Je viens de parler au président Trump. I just spoke to President Trump, and we agreed that Canada and the United States will temporarily restrict uh, all non-essential travel over the border. Travelers will no longer be permitted to cross the border for recreation and tourism. In both our countries, we're encouraging people to stay home. We're telling our citizens not to visit their neighbors if they don't absolutely have to. Well, this collaborative and reciprocal measure is an extension of that prudent approach. I want to be clear, though, that essential travel will continue. Our governments recognize that it is critical that we preserve supply chains between both countries. These supply chains ensure that food, fuel, and life-saving medicines reach people on both sides of the border. Supply chains, including trucking, will not be affected by this new measure. Canadians and Americans cross the border every day to do essential work or for other urgent reasons. That will not be impacted. Ces jours-ci, tous les Canadiens ressentent les conséquences de la COVID-19. These days, all Canadians are feeling the consequences of COVID-19. To ensure your safety, we are recommending to everyone that they work from home, to avoid public spaces, to buy only what they need at the grocery store, and especially to be kind and empathetic, empathetic towards those around you. We must all do our share to protect our health and those of the people around me is forcing us all to change our ways, and for many people, that's a huge adjustment. If you work in a restaurant, drive a cab, organize events, or freelance to pay your bills, working from home is not so simple. If, just like if you work in the oil and gas sector or the tourism and seafood industries, you're looking at the uncertainty in the global economy and probably wondering not only how long this is going to last, but how long your savings are going to last. No matter who you are or what you do, this is a time where you should be focused on your health and that of your neighbors. Not whether you're going to lose your job. Not whether you're going to run out of money for things like groceries and medication. Last week, we announced a whole range of measures to protect jobs, small businesses and the economy. From waiving the waiting period for employment insurance, sickness benefits to kick in, to increasing support for employers and businesses. We introduced special measures under the work sharing program to help employers who fall on hard times during COVID-19. And if your business faces a cash crunch, we will help you bridge to better times. We're working with our financial crown corporations through the business credit availability program to protect jobs and businesses with $10 billion in credit. Mais comme on l'a dit la semaine dernière, ce n'est qu'une première étape. Lorsqu'on a annoncé ces mesures, on a dit qu'on allait faire plus. Et c'est ce qui m'amène ici ce matin. Et dans ces extraordinaires temps, notre gouvernement est en train de prendre des mesures The measures we're announcing today will provide up to $27 billion in direct support to Canadian workers and businesses, plus $55 billion to meet liquidity needs of Canadian businesses and households through tax deferrals to help stabilize the economy. 
Combined, this $82 billion in support represents more than 3% of Canada's GDP. Let's start with people who don't qualify for employment insurance and don't have access to paid sick leave. Our government will introduce the Emergency Care Benefit, which will provide money every two weeks to workers who have to stay home. People will receive this benefit for 14 weeks for an amount comparable to what would be paid through EI. This applies to people who fall ill, people who have been placed in quarantine or have to self-isolate. It also applies to those who have to take care of a family member with COVID-19, but, as I said, fail to qualify for EI. If you lose your job and you do not qualify for EI, we will be introducing a COVID-19 emergency support benefit to help you. This will apply also to people who are self-employed and have to close shop because of the virus. Je veux commencer par faire par ce qu'on va faire like pour les gens. To begin by talking about what we're going to do for people who are not eligible to receive EI. Our government will introduce the emergency care benefit that will provide money to workers that have to remain home because of COVID-19 every two weeks. People will receive this benefit for 14 weeks and it will be an amount comparable to employment insurance. It is for people who fall ill, are placed in quarantine or those who have to self-isolate. It also applies to people who have to look after a family member infected with COVID-19. But as I said, they are not eligible for EI. If you lose your job and are ineligible for employment insurance, we will be introducing the emergency support benefit to help you. That measure will also apply to self-employed workers that have to cease their activities because of illness. Our government will take additional steps to protect jobs. We will provide employers of small businesses with a temporary wage subsidy equal to 10% of salary paid to employees for a period of three months. This will encourage employers to keep staff on the payroll during these uncertain times. To protect jobs, our government will offer employers uh, of small businesses a temporary wage subsidy equivalent to 10 percent of wages paid to their employees for a period of three months. This is a measure that will uh, help uh, employers to keep their workers on the payroll. And I know a lot of people are wondering what COVID-19 means for their personal finances. For those who filed their taxes and find out that they owe money, they will have until August 2020 to pay. If you file your tax return and you understand that you have to pay, you will have until August 2020 to pay. We are also expecting more targeted assistance in the coming months for various groups of individuals who are particularly affected by the virus or are in a vulnerable position. That brings me now to the next measure that we are announcing today, which affects parents. Young kids are going to find the coming months especially difficult with school closures and additional child care responsibilities. Parents already know how much the Canada Child Benefit helps with the costs of raising kids. To take some of that pressure off, our government will temporarily boost the CCB in the coming months. To help parents come through this difficult period, our government will be temporarily boosting the Canada Child Benefit within the next few months. With this plan, we're also going to do more for lower income people. In May, our government will supplement the GST credit, a tax free payment sent to low income Canadians every few months, to offset the consumer tax that they pay. Every adult who qualifies will receive up to $300 with $150 for every child. To help people with the modest or lower incomes, the government will increase the GST credit. In May, adults who are eligible will receive up to $300 and up to $150 per child. While all Canadians are feeling the impacts of COVID-19, some groups are particularly vulnerable.
for people who are still paying off their student loans, including young people and those who are starting a family, our government will put in place a six-month interest-free moratorium on their Canada student loans. For people experiencing homelessness, we are doubling the Reaching Home program, which provides funding to communities to help them address their local needs. For anyone fleeing domestic or gender-based violence, we will boost funding for shelters that provide sanctuary when self-isolating at home is simply not an option. And to support immediate needs in First Nations, Inuit and Métis Nation communities, we are setting up a distinctions-based Indigenous Community Support Fund. This list is by no means exhaustive. But these are some of the things our government is doing to make sure that no matter where you live, what you do or who you are, you will get the support you need during this time. In Canada, public health should never hinge on financial considerations. Aujourd'hui, Today, we are announcing a plan to help people. We are focusing on the most pressing needs, but as I've been saying from the start, our response will evolve as the situation also evolves. Whatever the future holds, Canadians can rely on us. Our work is to help you. It's to help you when you need it most. And that's exactly what we're doing with the measures we've announced thus far, and that is what we will continue to do. Now I want to turn to additional measures for businesses as part of this economic plan. To help businesses navigate these uncertain economic times, Export Development Canada will provide support to Canadian companies affected by the global situation. For farmers and our primary food producers, we will boost Farm Credit Canada. And we know some sectors of our economy are more vulnerable to COVID-19 than others. That's why in the coming days, we'll be looking at ways in which we can support them all, including through instruments like the Canada account. Today's announcement uh, follows up on the measures we've Canadians already taken to protect Canadians, to protect their health and our economy. Minister Morneau has also received from the Canadian banks a commitment to support businesses and people affected by COVID-19. I know he is in regular contact with them on this issue, as well as with business leaders and union leaders, as well as his international counterparts. is paying close attention to the economic impacts of decisions we make across the board to slow the spread of this virus. On Monday, I announced that Canada was closing its air borders to people who are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents, with some exceptions. We also announced a range of other measures on travel. But travel restrictions will not apply to commerce or trade. We are working continuously to ensure the supply of important goods to Canada. Today, we've announced $27 billion in direct support to Canadian workers and businesses, plus $55 billion to meet liquidity needs of Canadian businesses and households to help stabilize the economy through tax deferrals. Economic measures will ensure that our economy rebounds after this. And while we are taking a significant step today to help families get through these challenging times, our government is prepared to do more. But whether we're talking about economic, travel or health measures, collaboration and coordination remains essential. Our team is in constant communication with our colleagues in the provinces and territories, as well as Indigenous leaders and communities, to ensure that we have a coordinated, Canada-wide approach so we face this and recover from this together. We're also working with our international counterparts. Over the last number of days, I've spoken with leaders from around the world, including with fellow G7 leaders. Working together is how we'll get through this as families, as a community, as a country. Like many of you, over the past few days, I've seen stories of people doing just that, of people donating money to food banks to help those in need, of friends setting up online groups to chat, of retired nurses and doctors stepping up to health, of young people giving a hand to elderly neighbours by dropping off some extra groceries at their door. I have to tell you, 
It gives me a lot of hope. I want to close by recognizing everyone on the front lines who's doing an incredible job of keeping Canadians safe and healthy. Grocers keeping their shelves full and our families fed. Postal workers helping us stay home. Pharmacists filling our prescriptions. Healthcare professionals caring for our most vulnerable. Public health officials and first responders looking out for our safety. I know it's a hard time, but that's exactly why we need to keep supporting each other. Our government is here for you, and your fellow Canadians are here for you too. Merci. Thank you, everyone. Um, just before we get to questions, I'm supposed to model healthy behavior. I'm going to go grab my coat and I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's the Prime Minister running back into his house for his coat. Uh, maybe didn't realize how chilly it was. And here he is back after announcing $27 billion in direct payments to Canadians and $55 billion nice and sunny, in tax. But a little to brisk. Girls. And he's going to take cold. some questions now. Uh, hello, Mr. Trudeau. It's Annie Bergeron Oliver from CTV National News. I'm just wondering what assurances do you have from President Trump that if this pandemic gets worse, he will not close the borders, crippling trade? Uh, and necessary shipments in Canada. And also, how long do you expect this temporary closure to last? Will it be weeks? Are you planning for months? Uh, we talked about exactly that this morning, uh, President Trump and I, uh, to ensure that indeed our economies and our people that are so interconnected in so many different ways uh, will be able to ensure the smooth flow of goods and essential, uh, uh, essential materials and medication across the border. Uh, that is something uh, that we remain committed to. We will work in close collaboration on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure that that continues. Uh, and uh, these measures will last in place as long as we feel that they need to last. Uh, we will, again, closely coordinate on that as well. On the border with the U.S., how can you in concrete terms ensure that people will not come in and infect people here uh, from those uh, sites of infection? And uh, how can you ensure that the border will remain open for the free flow of goods and materials? Well, the fact is we are working very closely with the United States at this time to introduce specific rules that will keep both both Canadians and Americans safe. We understand that it's very important for the border to remain open because we're talking about $2 billion worth of goods that cross that border every single day. So it is critical, not just for the health of our economy, but for the health of our citizens, that that continue to be the case. But we will be looking at this issue to ensure that those measures protect Canadians while at the same time allowing us to bring in the goods we need. Need. Now, with respect to the duration, how long this will last, well, we will continue to do it as long as it's necessary, while at the same time coordinating the situation between our two countries. CBC News. Prime Minister, with all these economic measures being announced, is it inevitable that we're heading into a recession? I think right now we are focused on making sure that uh, people who uh, are not uh, getting income or revenue because of this COVID-19 uh, challenge, have the money to be able to pay for groceries, uh, to pay their rent, to support their families through this difficult time. We recognize that many businesses are closed, uh, many uh, workplaces have significant slowdowns, if not stoppages, and that is going to have an economic impact. But we also know that the fundamentals of the Canadian economy are strong. And in a number of weeks or a number of months or however long it takes, uh, once we get rolling again, the capacity of the federal government uh, to invest in the economy, to support businesses and individuals, will ensure that we bounce back strongly. We have the fiscal room to do this because of prudent decision-making over the past five years. We will be able to ensure that our economy gets back up to speed very quickly. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. Today you are announcing billions of dollars for Canadians. 
quand est-ce que c'est beaucoup probablement plus facile à annoncer qu'à faire? It's probably uh, more easy to announce than to actually do it. When will Canadians actually be receiving that money? Well, we're talking about a few weeks for the aid checks uh, to be produced, particularly for those who don't qualify for EI. There are legislative measures that are needed, so we are working with the other parties who are fully cooperating with us in order to us in order for us to pass those measures through the House of Commons and get the money out. But the money is being done right now, in fact, uh, even before the House returns, so that we can get that money to people as quickly as possible so they have it when they need it. Maura Forrest, Politico. Uh, Prime Minister, yesterday you talked about the possibility of invoking the Emergencies Act. Today you're saying that the Canada-US border will be closed to non-essential travel. How close are you at this point to imposing restrictions across Canada? And specifically, are you considering limiting travel within Canada as well? I have said uh, time and time again uh, that we are looking at all options. We're not taking any options off the table. Uh, every day we've been announcing new measures uh, that we've been able to move forward on, and we will continue to look at measures as they become necessary uh, and the tools that exist uh, to make those measures necessary. Uh, I will highlight, of course, that the Emergency Measures Act is a significant step, uh, not one that we feel we need today, but not one that we are closing the door to uh, in the future if necessary. Okay. Uh, Today we are announcing certain measures and every single day we will be announcing additional measures. Right now we have all the necessary authorities to announce and move forward with these measures. Uh, we are not ruling out any possibility in terms of the tools we may need to use. I did talk about the Emergency Measures Act and that is an extremely important and serious step to take. So as long as we don't need it, we do not intend to invoke it. But at the same time, we are keeping that possibility open because at some time that may be necessary. But right now we're using all the other to tools we have to keep Canadians safe. Politics, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you rolled out or you know, talked about a lot of economic and uh, stimulus measures that you're planning to put in force. What kind of reassurances can you give to Canadians at this time that the government has the you know, infrastructure, in place and the, and the people in place considering the directive to work from home that this that this money will roll out in a timely and efficient manner there are um, many families across this country who are looking at their sources of income dry up because of covid 19. many of them qualify for ei many workers qualify for ei and we're making sure that with the elimination of the one week waiting period that money will be able to flow significantly and quickly to them Many families do not qualify for EI, uh, many workers do not qualify for EI, and therefore we're putting in place exceptional measures that will flow money to them every two weeks. Our capacity to do this is something that we have spent a lot of uh, time over the past days ensuring, because we know that that could make the difference not just between one family uh, facing tougher times or not, but it could make a difference on the health of all Canadians. People need to be able to self-isolate, need to be able to stay home, need to be able to care for their families when their ordinary sources of revenue dry up. That uh, is why we're putting forward $27 million in direct supports to Canadians and businesses. That is why uh, we are uh, moving forward on freeing up $55 billion that will stay in the economy because of uh, delayed uh, tax payments uh, to make sure that people uh, can cover the things they need to in the coming days, along with all our extra measures uh, for shelters, uh, for Indigenous communities, uh, through the Canada Child Benefit and others that will ensure that Canadians have the confidence that they will be okay through this difficult time, because we are all in this together, and we are there for you. On va maintenant passer aux journalistes qui sont sur la ligne. Moderateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. The first question is from Lina Dib de la Presse canadienne. À vous la parole. Please go ahead. Uh, oui, bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Uh, Good la morning, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, British Columbia has been asking last, uh, since last week that the border be closed. Uh, now, you saw the number of cases in Washington and the numbers in B.C. that have gone way up. 
Why did you not close the border sooner? And do you believe do you believe that perhaps you acted a bit too too late for BC? Well, we took major measures on Monday to close off our borders to international travelers, and uh, we took two days to coordinate this further measure with the United States to ensure that we do it properly and uh, in cooperation with each other. The Deputy Prime Minister, Ms. Freeland, called uh, Vice President Pence yesterday for the very purpose of beginning discussions uh, on the final phase, and we were able to make that announcement today, and we know that it will provide a lot of help to everyone across the country. Uh, we recognize uh, that we took some significant steps over the past few days. Uh, we closed the borders to overseas travel uh, on Monday, uh, and today, two days later, uh, we announce uh, that we are restricting non-essential travel between Canada and the United States. Uh, this is something that we've been coordinating with the United States on over the past days. Uh, yesterday, the Vice, Pre uh, Vice Prime Deputy Prime Minister Freeland uh, reached out to Vice President Pence uh, to uh, really advance these negotiations and were able to announce it uh, in a coordinated fashion uh, on both sides of the border this morning. This is something uh, that we need to move forward on to connect to protect Canadians. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Bill Curry from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Avez-vous la parole? Hi, Prime Minister. We're seeing in uh, the United States uh, some lawmakers are discussing the possibility of sending direct checks to all Americans as a way of uh, you, you sacrifice targeting those most in need, but the benefit is it gets there faster. And so you've gone with some existing programs that might involve people kind of dealing with the government and applying for these programs that could sacrifice speed. So can you talk about uh, your thought process in going with this route as opposed to something like direct checks that might be simpler? Uh, I, I know the finance minister is about to give a press conference uh, in which he will answer many of these questions, but I can, I can say that we are confident that getting these measures out, particularly around EI and folks who don't qualify for EI uh, within the next few weeks to compensate for lost income, uh, is going to make a significant difference to people who, uh, who had an income but have seen it dry up. Over these, uh, over these days because of COVID-19. Uh, many people on uh, pensions or benefits uh, or uh, supports of various types uh, will, still, uh, will, of course, still receive those supports. Uh, we really wanted to target those people who would lose their income specifically. We've also put on, on the table uh, significant support for businesses and employers to be able to support their workers, to be able to support their fellow Canadians. These are the kinds of things that we're moving with both quickly and in a targeted fashion, because that's what Canadians expect. Merci beaucoup. Moderator, on va passer à la prochaine question. Merci. Thank you. The next question is from Melanie Marquis from La Presse. À vous la parole. Please go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. About the border, could you tell us when the border will actually close to non-essential travel and how will it be possible to uh, ensure that you enforce that uh, restriction? Will you have to bring in the army or on Roxham Road, there are still people crossing the border, for example. First of all, we are working with the United States so that those measures can come into effect very quickly, and we'll have more uh, to say about that later, but it will be happening very soon. I also want to point out that we do have ways of ensuring that non-essential travelers will not be able to cross the border. The Canada Border Services Agency have, has adequate resources uh, to meet that challenge, particularly since a lot of people will simply decide to stay home and won't even try to cross the border if they're told not to do so. 
With respect to Roxham Road, I can reassure you in saying that every measure is being taken to ensure that uh, that uh, border crossing is uh, is uh, properly controlled and that people are uh, put into quarantine for 14 days. Thank you. The next question is from Heather Schofield from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Good morning, Prime Minister. Um, in terms of working with the opposition and, and having to um, pass some of these uh, some of these steps through through them, have you been t in touch with the opposition leaders, and do you have their assurance that that um, they will cooperate with you to move quickly? Our House leaders have been working together uh, very closely, both on the House side and on the Senate side. Uh, our, uh, Pablo Rodriguez and Minister Pablo Rodriguez and uh, Senator Mark Gold uh, have been engaged with uh, all party leaders, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, there is uh, broad collaboration. There is uh, broad uh, openness to moving these measures quickly that will uh, help Canadians who need it. Uh, I am confident that this is a moment in which Canadians of all parties will will pull together to ensure Canadians get the help they need. Uh Minister Rodriguez and Senator Mark Gold are cooperating at this time with their counterparts from the other parties to ensure that we can pass those measures through the House as quickly as possible. And I can tell you that there is a real desire on the part of the opposition to help Canadians, and we are confident that these can go through quickly. Now, uh, personally, I can tell you uh, I'm fine. The children are fine. No symptoms as of yet. Sophie is still dealing with the flu and uh, headaches uh, and so forth, but she is still okay. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for thinking of thinking of us all. Thank you very much. And that is the Prime Minister of Canada speaking outside of his home at Rideau Cottage to give us some significant news today, both about the temporary closure of the border, which will be uh, now limited to essential travel, so uh, the recreation, tourism, those kinds of things, totally off the table now. But goods uh, that need to go back and forth across the border will continue to do so, as well as essential work that might be needed, which will be reassuring to people that have to do that. Uh, the Prime Minister also announcing 20 $27 billion in direct payments to Canadians. Uh, and we'll go through some of those measures with my colleagues and $55 billion in tax deferrals. Um, all right, let's bring in Vashi Capellas and the CBC's David Cochran. Um, so th th it was in terms of uh, the amount, it was pretty much what we expected, $27 billion. Um, Vashi, that is all direct payments to Canadians that will start, the Prime Minister said, in the next few weeks. Yeah, and, and through, like David has been reporting since last night, existing programs. So the first big chunk of it is for people who don't qualify for EI. So for example, if you have to take sick days because we've been told by public health officials, even if we're feeling just mildly ill, we don't know it's coronavirus, but it could be something else, you should be staying home. So it looks like you will be able to access EI through sort of two various programs, mm -hmm. and, you know, one entitled COVID-19 emergency support, another one as an emergency care program. Uh, and this will last for uh, up to 15 weeks at this point, obviously subject to change. But essentially, you'll get as much as you would on EI, which is up to $900 for a two-week span every every two weeks. Uh, there's a number of other things, including for small business owners, for example, a lot of people who can't keep their employees on the payroll if they don't have any revenue coming in. The government is offering ten, a 10% wage subsidy, a temporary wage subsidy for a period of three months to encourage them, the prime minister says, to keep those employees on the payroll. Uh, parents, a lot of parents who obviously have to stay home because... Pretty much schools across the country are shut down, daycare services in much of the country as well. So if you have to stay home to care for your kids, you'll, you'll be able to access either some of those previous programs I spoke of or they're boosting uh, through the Canada Child Benefit, the payments that you would get there. They're also increasing the GST credit. I know it's a lot of information, but th 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 this was all handed to us just through this press conference. Uh, increasing the GST credit as well as a six-month moratorium on student loan payments, and that will be... Uh, 
uh, it, you won't accrue any interest uh, or have to pay any interest at the end of that period as well. The other big thing is taxes. They've extended, and this is a big one, I think, for a lot of people watching, knowing that that deadline was coming up. Extend the tax filing deadline for individuals to June 1st and allow all taxpayers to defer until after August 31st of 2020, so basically until September. If you file your taxes and you end up owing something, you don't have to pay it until September, right. and there won't be any interest or penalties for not paying it during that time as well. And that is where that sort of second big chunk that you referenced, the yeah. $55 billion in tax deferrals, that's where that comes in because that's going to be really important not only for individuals but for businesses too. Yeah, okay. Uh, we got about five minutes until the finance minister pops up. Uh, just let me say two things, David, and I'll let you go in. Uh, there's also some targeted money for Indigenous communities. Obviously, in a remote community, uh, things are, di are different. So there's $305 million for uh, Indigenous communities, uh, a support fund needed there. And just to give people an example of how this might work, these new EI measures, um, if you're sick or if you have to stay home and look after someone, Someone who's sick, you can tap into that if you don't qualify for EI. And I think that's really important because lots of people don't. They're either self-employed or, or haven't qualified yet. Uh, David, you go ahead on what you thought was, I guess, the, the central message from the Prime Minister about it sounds like this is not necessarily over yet either. Yeah, he's, look, he's essentially said if you don't qualify for EI, you will now qualify for something equivalent to EI. The mechanics of it need to be worked out, but there are two programs that cover everyone from the sick to the self-employed or the people who lose their job before they got the hours they need. You're going to be looked after at at least an employment insurance level, so that is there. The central message for Canadians today is that they do not want financial pressures compromising the national public health crisis and that you don't feel obligated to, to, to put yourself at, at risk financially mm -hmm. to take on work you shouldn't be doing to do things you shouldn't be doing in a way that will compromise the need for a national public health response so that's important uh, the numbers are also quite eye-popping we had the 27 billion dollars roughly on direct aid but this is 82 billion dollars which is three percent of the GDP in total stimulus through the measures that Vashi has outlined and look folks if you can't keep up with it we can barely keep up with it too because mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. a fire hose of information but uh, Rosie this 82 billion is on top of the 10 billion in credit that was extended uh, to small and medium-sized businesses on Friday and on top of the one billion that was announced on Wednesday of last week to boost the health response. So the national response to this in a week is 93 yeah. billion dollars and it's just beginning because if you look at the measures that were outlined here today they all last for a minimum of 12 to 14 weeks which gives you a sense of the low end of the duration that this government is preparing the country for to deal with the national response to COVID-19. You've got a three-month financial floor under a lot of people, under a lot of businesses. There's money there for uh, Export Development Canada and Farm Credit Canada to really help trade sensitive sectors that are going to be really hurt by border closures and the lack of traffic and bringing in temporary foreign workers, for example, to work in the agricultural sector with a promise of even more to come. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you have acutely vulnerable sectors like tourism and travel, the tech sector, for instance, that may support uh, uh, back-end support to retailers in this company that often take years to get to profitability. They are in a real lurch right now because of the global shutdown of sort of in-store commerce in, in, in most countries. So this is a, a significant response at 3% of the GDP on top of what was already announced. More to come, and it's going to take several, several months, Rosie, before this even starts to look like normal. Okay. Right, and, and the okay. Prime Minister is saying that he, he wants to ensure that our economy can rebound when this is yeah. all over. I'm just going to put you two on hold if I can. We're standing by for the Finance Minister. Let me bring in Gareth Watson, though, in Toronto. He's a wealth advisor at Richardson GMP, a wealth management firm, and he joins us now. Uh, Mr. Watson, anything there that, that surprises you? I mean, it does sound like no matter where you are uh, working in the Canadian economy, there is an answer for you in terms of aid from the government. I think the key here thing, uh, Rosie, first of all, is that liquidity is trying to be provided to consumers. You know, normally we look to central banks to provide liquidity to banks and financial institutions. Here the government's reaching out directly to consumers and the $27 billion, of course, was expected. That's about $720 per Canadian. So in terms of whether this is just a start, I'd have to say, yes, it is just a start. I know you were talking or, or Dave was talking about $93 billion. We have to understand also here that a lot of the, if you look through that release, there's a lot of the word deferral in here mm -hmm. a lot. So it's not a forgiveness, it's a deferral. So eventually people will be expected to pay their mortgage and will be expected to pay their taxes. 
they're not being cut a break on this. But in the short term, yes, that number is absolutely huge in terms of providing that liquidity. For me, the, the big concern here is the implementation, the infrastructure that we have in place to put this to work and getting it into people's hands quickly. I know we're probably going to have the finance minister answer those questions soon. Yeah, I mean, it does sound like they're using a couple of the measures that are out there, whether it be the child uh, tax benefit, a GST credit for people who are, are more vulnerable, I guess, through EI measures. But if you don't qualify for EI, yeah, I take your point. I don't know how you get that quickly into your hands and legislation has to be passed. Can you explain a little bit that the $55 billion in tax deferral, this is just the money that Canadians would normally have paid that will now be put off and and the the intent behind that in terms of the economy is what just to allow them more money to spend absolutely to, yeah. to, to hold on to what they have for now and if they have employees perhaps it can keep them employed uh, a lot of small businesses pay their taxes on a quarterly basis as yeah. opposed to us individually paying them on an annual basis so basically the prime minister is saying look right now this is not our focus is to collect your taxes keep that money if it helps you keep people employed please do so if it helps you continue your business please do so uh and you know that's just right now the key here is credit okay we can talk about equities and stocks all you want but the credit <laughs> markets are the key to the survival of the economy on both and in any economy quite frankly and you'll see that in the united states as well the flow of money in the economy is what is key if that stops then we're in trouble so right now the government is saying first of all the bank of canada is saying we're going to keep the money flowing to financial institutions that's key and now the government's saying we're going to keep the money at least not necessarily flowing to canadians but making sure that they can keep what they've got yeah. so that they can spend it because they need it how is how is this different? It's not at all comparable. I understand uh, to 2008, but but are there measures here that are 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 different or similar or or make sense given what we experienced in 2008? No, in terms of the measures, no. This is far more expansive. This is far yeah. because the the consumers or we as Canadians are being far more directly impacted than the financial crisis. And of course, that was more of an American story than it was a Canadian story. Sure. Uh, I, I would I would say though that if Right now, it's not the exact same as 2008, but if credit and liquidity dries up, it can become 2008. I'm not saying that to scare people, but I do want your viewers to be aware of the fact that liquidity and credit are key here. And if the economy does slow down and grind to a halt, then that's going to be the biggest concern. So right now, but, I but won't say it's a But there seems to be an here. awareness of that, wouldn't you say, from, from both the Bank Absolutely. of Canada and the government? Yeah, the, in terms of, and that would speak to the measures that they put in place last week. Last Friday was key to have OSFI, uh, the finance minister, and the central bank governor all together on stage in a united front talking about making sure, look, we've got the backs of financial institutions, we're here for you, and we've got the backs of Canadians, and we're going to try and do our best. Now, to be fair, both the central bank and the government alone cannot fix this problem. At the end of the day, it's with you and me. It's the societal response that's going to get us through this. They're just trying to soften the blow. They're not going to solve the problem. They're just going to try and help us through it. And at the end of the day, like I said, it's everyday Canadians that are going to get us through this problem. What, one last question. The, the Prime Minister made it very clear there that this is not necessarily the end of government measures, $27 billion in direct payments. They say they have uh, certain fiscal capacity. I think the PBO has set up to $40 billion. Uh, what, is, there, is there still room here for Canada to dole out more money if needed? I, I hope so, because I do think there's another wave to come. We're just addressing, let's just call it the first direct wave of people that are impacted. Uh, and, and you can go through all the different industries and you already have in terms of those that are directly hit. There's going to be secondary industries that rely on those first industries that are eventually sure. going to uh, uh, have problems. And that's where some of these programs will be expanded. But just to put things into perspective, you know, $27 billion is just north of $700 a Canadian. In the United States, with the trillion dollar package they're putting together, that's just north of $3,000 an American. And I'm not saying that we have the capacity to do what the Americans do, because they are certainly the capital formation people of the world. But it does illustrate that perhaps we do have some capacity to go higher. And I certainly don't think that the prime minister has put all the chips on the table in the first run. OK, Gareth Watson, super, uh, super good expertise and, and uh, perspective there. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Gareth Watson is in Toronto. All right, let's bring back my colleagues, Vashi and uh, David, to talk a little bit more. Get, let, can we just talk a little bit about the border? Uh, because I, I, I guess I understood some of it. I am not sure I heard a timeline. I'm not sure if either of you did. Like, is this happening in a week, a month, is it tomorrow? I, I'm not sure anyone was that precise hmm. about anything. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure either. Good point, Rosie. That's. <laughs> I, I mean, I was really much. I was really listening for, and I know our colleagues in the newsroom as well 
what exactly does this d definition, how, how, what does it mean for specific people? So my understanding, you know, is that truckers, for example, will still be able to get through? Because the point the prime minister uh, seemed to be aiming to make was the, the flow of goods will still exist, that this is not meant to cripple the economy. But essentially, what I understand, and, and please weigh in if you have a different understanding, is basically tourists are shut out. So yeah, if you yeah. want to come here to visit or if you want to leave Canada to visit the United States, you will no longer be able to do so. Again, I'm not exactly positive on the timeline for that. That's a great question. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, if somebody's watching from uh, the Prime Minister's office and wants to let us know, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that information ASAP to relay we'll, it to we'll our viewers. Call. We'll take yeah, that call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I do think it is important to note uh, who will be. It sounds like, for example, we had our reporter in Windsor talking about many of the healthcare workers or people who work over there uh, or, or vice versa. Will they still be able to traverse the border? It sounded to me like they would be able to, that mm -hmm. it really is a shutdown to tourists. Yeah, yeah, and anyone that's going over there, I, I gave some stats earlier, a lot of people just go over for day trips to right. to purchase things or to visit people or what have you. Uh, yeah. David, any, any different understanding from your perspective? Like, I, yeah. I also wonder if you're visiting a family member, would that be, I guess, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure this was supposed to roll out exactly like this, to be frank, because I, I feel like there's a lot of missing pieces to uh, questions that people will have, timeline yeah. being the primary one. I think we can have some insight into some of the exceptions, but certainly not all of the exceptions mm -hmm. on what will qualify as essential travel. We're all focusing on truckers and trucks because, you know, trucks go across the border every day. But when they did d announce the denial of entry to non-Canadians and non-permanent residents of Canada, excluding the United States, they did single out other specific groups. There were flight crews, for example, yeah. truck crews, yeah. cross-border marine crews, and cross-border train crews. So a lot of goods move across the border by boat or, you know, in the big containers and stuff like, you know, it's not a tr and also on trains. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would suspect, based on what Minister Garneau and Minister Blair spelled out on Monday when the larger denial of entry uh, rollout was announced, that you can look at those particular groups. Um, you know, what's really interesting, too, in, in, in what Gareth Watson was just saying, this is not, this is kind of a life raft announcement today yeah. you know like uh, the economy is kind of sinking and these are the boats for everybody to get into for the time being um, because the enormity of this is not even close to being felt we, we've seen pandemics come in waves in the past with h1n1 and with SARS there was a peak and then a trough and then a small bump back up so there's probably future waves of, of, of this potentially coming and when we say that this package is three percent of GDP Jim Stanford the, who's in Australia right now but the former economist for the, for the Canadian auto workers he points out that that three percent is a little bit misleading because the 55 billion in tax yeah. deferrals yeah. is mm -hmm. money that will have to be paid back eventually now it does keep it in the economy for now. For now. You yeah. know, if yeah. you owe money and you're a cash intensive business, you don't suddenly have to dip into your reserves and, and send it to Bill Morneau to spend. Uh -huh. You get to keep uh -huh. it to keep your business afloat. Uh, but again, all of this could change, Rosie, because sure. uh, as they say, this is the start of their response. Um, as Vashi has been saying, and we've been hearing, the big fear in government right now is what they don't know and what they can't predict. So they're not going to roll out the full capacity of what they can do right now and then not have anything to offer down the road as circumstances change, which will cause a real loss of confidence and a panic in the markets and in Canadian households. Yeah. So there is firepower still in reserve even after these eye-popping numbers and widespread measures today. Yeah, and that has been sort of the story, both on the economic measures and the public health measures, which is is a ramp up as mm -hmm. as needed. I guess the question uh, that that I certainly can't answer is: Is this enough right now, um, mm -hmm. or should it have been more significant? I, I do think that the 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 part about the the fifty five tax uh, fifty five billion of tax deferral, Vashi is as as uh, Mr. Watson was saying, a real lesson in the importance of keeping uh, liquidity in the economy writ mm -hmm. large, and that's something that we learned from the two thousand eight recession. Okay, the final. Finance Minister is approaching, so I'll get you both to stick around and talk to me after. Uh, but we will listen both to Bill Morneau and the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polaz, who's made two rate cuts in the past uh, two weeks, but we understand doesn't have uh, an announcement necessarily today. They are sitting that far apart and in a different room well, good because morning. they are trying and, uh, to show social distancing themselves uh, at this press I'm conference. Let's listen in now live. On what the Prime Minister announced this morning. I want to begin by acknowledging the diligence of frontline health care workers who are treating patients and the public health care providers who are working tirelessly to slow the spread of this disease, this virus. They've worked extremely hard in recent times to prepare our country as we pull together. 
Last week, we announced funding to make sure our provinces and our territories have everything necessary in order to protect Canadians and make sure that the federal government was doing everything that it could. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the countless others who are helping us to get through a very challenging time. Across the country, cleaners and janitors are keeping spaces clean and disinfected. At grocery stores and at pharmacies, people are working hard to restock shelves and manage difficult situations. IT and telecom workers are making sure that our networks are functioning well as more and more Canadians work from home. Truckers, rail workers, air cargo workers, and postal workers are working to make sure that we have the essential goods that we need. At food banks and at shelters, workers are facing growing uncertainty with dedication and with a sense of duty. There are countless others who, in these difficult times, have showed immense patience and determination in making sure that Canadians have the goods and services that they need. So I want to thank all of you for all that you're doing. The health and safety of Canadians is our government's top priority. We continue to urge Canadians to stay home and to follow the advice from medical professionals and from public health officials. Please take all necessary precautions to protect your health. It's not just about you. It's about your neighbours. It's about your colleagues. It's about your family members. La santé et la sécurité des Canadiens et des Canadiennes sont la priorité absolue de notre gouvernement. Nous continuons d'insister pour que tous les Canadiens qui peuvent rester à la maison le fassent et pour que tous suivent les conseils des professionnels de la santé et des responsables de la santé publique. S'il vous plaît, prenez toutes les précautions nécessaires pour protéger votre santé. Please take all the necessary precautions to protect your health. It's not only about you, it's about your neighbours and your colleagues and the members of your family. We all have a role to play to flatten the curve and to protect those who are most vulnerable. We have to look out for each other. That's what Canadians do. We need that Canadian spirit now, more than ever. COVID-19 is having a significant impact on our economy, an impact that continues to evolve. At this stage, the full breadth and the scope of the impact remain unknown. I want to acknowledge the Prime Minister's leadership. This is a challenge like none that we've ever faced before. Facing up to it demands swift and decisive action. A coordinated approach is absolutely necessary at this time. I'm in contact with provincial and territorial partners, with the private sector, and with my colleagues, other finance ministers from around the world. I've also been working very closely with federal colleagues, including Governor Polos from the Bank of Canada, who's here with me today. Together, we're working hard to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 on the Canadian and on the global economy. Clearly, the impacts of this pandemic have been profound and will continue to be profound. Households and businesses are already feeling the effects. Our government is prepared to do whatever it takes to keep our economy strong and stable, whatever it takes. I want to address something off the top. Usually my job is to ensure that we maintain our fiscal track. But right now, as Minister of Finance, my only job is to make sure that Canadians can keep food in the fridge that they can keep a roof over their heads, that they can afford the medicine that they need. As you've heard me say many times before, we've entered this challenge in a very strong fiscal position. Canada's balance sheet is the envy of the world, and it means we have the fiscal firepower to respond. We're now prepared to use it. COVID-19 is an extraordinary challenge that requires an extraordinary investment. Today, we're announcing the first phase, the first phase of Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan. We'll provide $27 billion of direct support to people and businesses, which is more than 1% of our GDP. On top of this, we'll defer $55 billion in tax revenue, leaving that money in the economy. 
For the economists listening, that's 3% of GDP that would not be in the economy without these actions. For all Canadians, this means we're doing whatever it takes to support you and your family as we contain this virus. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons la première phase de notre plan d'intervention économique du Canada pour répondre à la COVID-19. Nous fournirons 27 milliards de dollars de soutien direct aux individus et aux entreprises ce qui représente plus de 1% de PIB. Which represents more than 1% of GDP. Plus, nous rapporterons 55 milliards de dollars de recettes fiscales, laissant cet argent and injecting that money into the economy. For the economy, that represents 3% of the GDP that uh, will be in action. For Canadians, it means that we are doing everything necessary to support you as the virus continues. To get money into people's hands so that no matter what happens during this period, they can afford the essentials. And we're working to make sure that no one gets left behind. First and foremost, we know that people are worried about their health. So if you're needing to quarantine or to self-isolate or care for a loved one who's sick, you can get around $450 per week, even if you don't qualify for employment insurance. The new, what we're calling emergency care benefit will provide self-employed Canadians, contractors, freelancers, part-time workers, gig economy workers, many of our cultural workers and more with income security if they can't work because they're in self-isolation or in quarantine or taking care of a loved one. This benefit will provide income support of $900 every two weeks for up to 15 weeks. La nouvelle allocation de soins d'urgence the new emergency care benefit will allow self-employed workers, entrepreneurs, part-time workers, cultural workers, and others income security if they cannot work because they are in quarantine or isolation or because they're caring for a member of their family. This will provide some $900 every two weeks for a period of 15 weeks. Unable to work because schools and daycares are closed. Or if you need to take care of a sick family member, you'll also qualify for the emergency care benefit. Canadians can apply online at home, allowing them to follow public health guidelines, and they can receive payment via direct deposit. It will require a simple attestation that will not require medical documentation. We want this to be as easy as possible so that people who need this help can get this help. The benefit will be available starting in early April. This is about saving lives. No Canadian will have to worry about protecting their health and putting food on the table. This new measure builds on the announcement the Prime Minister made last week that we're waiving the one-week waiting period to access the employment insurance sickness benefits for people who are sick or in quarantine. We also know that people are worried about struggling to pay the bills if they lose their jobs or see their hours reduced. We want you to know <clears throat> that we have your back. For any worker who loses their job and does not qualify for employment insurance, we'll be introducing a new benefit, the emergency support benefit, for which we've set aside $5 billion. More details will come in the near future, but you can rest assured that the federal government will provide you with 14 weeks of support at a comparable level to the employment insurance program. There are also over 12 million Canadian families with low and modest incomes who will need extra financial support at this time. The government will provide a GST credit averaging close to $400 for single adults and $600 for couples to see you through. And to help families keep their kids well-fed and provided for, the government will issue a special Canada Child Benefit, top-up, of $300 per child. For a single parent with two children earning minimum wage, these two measures combined will mean around $1,500 of special support. For tout travailleur qui perd son emploi et qui n'est pas admissible, à leur science d'emploi, nous allons introduire une nouvelle allocation, l'allocation de soutien d'urgence, pour laquelle nous avons réservé 5 milliards de dollars. Plus de détails viendront dans un avenir rapproché, 
mais vous pouvez être assuré que le gouvernement fédéral vous donnera, vous donnera 14 semaines de soutien à un niveau comparable à l'assurance. Plus de 12 millions de revenus faibles et modestes ont besoin de soutien financier. Le gouvernement accordera le crédit de la TPE provide a, a GST top-up of some $400 for lone adults and close to $600 for couples, and to help uh, families look after their children. The government will provide a Canada Child Benefit top-up of some $300 per child for a lone parent with two children who earns minimum wage. These two combined measures will represent some $1,000 $500 of support. We know seniors are worried too. First and foremost, please take care of your health. Practice social distancing and make sure you're listening to medical advice. We also know you're concerned about the impact of recent market volatility on your retirement funds. We will help you protect the value of your retirement fund by temporarily reducing the minimum withdrawal on registered retirement income funds by 25%. We'll continue to monitor this issue as markets evolve. And I want to assure you that your OAS and GIS payments will continue as usual, without any interruption. Many young Canadians who are starting out in their careers are worried about what this uncertainty will mean to their finances. We're putting in place a six-month interest-free moratorium on student Canada student loan paybacks. This means nearly a million Canadians will have an extra $160 a month during this period. We know that Indigenous communities face a greater risk of financial insecurity, so we're creating a distinctions-based Indigenous Community Support Fund. It's crucial that we support our most vulnerable at this time. And that, of course, has to include shelters. Shelters across the country will need the tools to prevent outbreaks. So we'll invest over $200 million to support the homeless through homeless shelters, sexual assault centers, and shelters for women and children to help with the purchase of necessary equipment to implement the best medical advice for keeping people safe and healthy. Partout au pays, les refuges auront besoin Across the country, shelters will, will need resources to prevent outbreaks. We will invest close to $200 million to support shelters for the homeless, sexual assault centers, and halfway homes and transition homes for women and children so that they can do everything that they can to put in place the best medical advice to ensure the health and safety of Canadians. We need businesses to keep going so that they can keep employees on staff. I know many small and medium-sized businesses and organizations are very concerned about their ability to keep paying their workers. For small employers, we will provide a 10% wage subsidy for the next three months, up to $25,000 per employer. This is effective immediately and will help keep Canadians employed. Je sais I know that many small and medium-sized businesses are very concerned about their ability to continue to pay their workers. For small businesses and organizations, we will provide a wage subsidy of 10% for the next three months, up to an amount of $25,000 per employer. This will come into force immediately, and this will help keep Canadians at work last week to enhance the work sharing program, which will help workers facing reduced hours to get by and help businesses and employers in these difficult times. We also announced Business Credit Availability Program, which will provide $10 billion in credit support through the Business Development Bank of Canada and Export Development Canada to help businesses and organizations get the financing that they need to keep operating and to keep their employees on. We're prepared to provide additional financial support as necessary. On Friday, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions took action to free up $300 billion in lending capacity. The Bank of Canada, the Governor of the Bank of Canada, also announced a rate cut of 50 basis points to stabilize our economy. 
We know that businesses in some sectors are more affected than others, like air transportation and the oil and gas sector, and we know that they will need specific help. EDC and BDC are currently developing a tailored set of tools for them and for other affected sectors. At the same time, the federal government will begin working with the government of Alberta on support for workers in the oil and gas sector. We'll make a significant investment in orphan well remediation to help both companies and workers in the province. And we'll be ready to make an announcement on this in the coming days. Canadians are also worried, of course, about bills that are coming due. On Monday, the Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation reinstated the Insured Mortgage Protection Program. Through this program, the corporation will offer $50 billion so that banks and mortgage lenders can offer Canadians payment deferrals, special payment arrangements, or other options to assist homeowners through this time. Compounded with other liquidity tools that we've mentioned, this will mean that there's now $500 billion in credit available to Canadian businesses and households. I've also been talking to the heads of Canada's largest banks, and they've committed to me that they will work with individuals and with businesses on a case-by-case -case basis to provide additional flexibility in the face of hardships. As a first step, this support will include up to a six-month deferral program for mortgages and specific opportunities for relief on other credit products, like skip a payment on auto loans or on credit cards. Our banks have a, a long history of standing by Canadians through challenging times. I encourage Canadians to contact your bank directly to discuss your situation and to get the help that you need. J'ai également parlé aux dirigeants des grands banques canadiennes. I've been with the heads of major Canadian banks and have encouraged them to work with the businesses and individuals to find practical solutions given this context. First, this support will allow for a six-month deferral for mortgage loans and the possibility of easing credit. Our banks have always supported Canadians throughout difficult times, and I would encourage Canadians to communicate directly with their banks to discuss their situations and to obtain the support that you need. Personal income taxes, Canadian businesses who owe cor corporate uh, income tax now only need to pay it before September 1st. This frees up $55 billion in temporary tax relief, and it keeps that money circulating in our economy. We know this is a time when individuals and businesses need to have money at hand. And also, given the extraordinary times, we've extended the tax filing deadline until June 1st. Les Canadiens qui doivent, de l doivent payer de Canadians who sur must pay taxes on personal income and Canadian corporations who, who that, that, or, that owe corporate income will not have to pay until September 1st. That frees up $55 million of tax relief and allows this money to circulate freely in our economy. We know that this is a time when individuals and businesses need um, readily available money. Furthermore, uh, given these extraordinary times, we have uh, extended the deadline for filing the tax returns until uh, June 1st. With Labour and other leaders across Canada. On Monday, I spoke to all of the CEOs of our major grocery stores. They've told me that their supply chains are still working, working well. And they've committed to me that during this crisis, they will maintain fair prices for their customers. As a reminder to Canadians, when you're out shopping, please make sure that you're leaving goods on the, on the shelves for your neighbours who might be waiting for a check to come before they can buy the things that they need. We all need to pull together and to do our part during this time. And I want to say that this work is just beginning. As your Minister of Finance, I will do whatever it takes. In order to follow through on these commitments, we'll be tabling emergency legislation to provide timely support to Canadians, as well as to ensure that we have all the tools to support them and businesses as things continue to evolve during these very uncertain times. 
It's our collective responsibility to ensure we continue to have the tools to respond quickly as things evolve. These tools will be essential to give Canadians the certainty that their government can rapidly implement measures to protect them and to protect our economy. I'm calling on all parties and the Senate to work with us and to support this legislation. There can be no delay. But I also want to say that I'm confident that all parliamentarians will rise to this occasion. Canadians are counting on us. I want to turn it over now to Governor Polos for a moment before I make some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Minister. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Canadians expect their policymakers uh, to do what it takes to support them in this difficult period. The circumstances that we face today require all hands on deck. Each institution is acting within its respective mandate to deliver a powerful confidence-boosting package of measures for consumers, business, and financial markets. For its part, the Bank of Canada has been working hard to ensure that the financial system has sufficient liquidity so that credit continues to be available to businesses and to households. To recap briefly, on Monday, the bank adjusted its liquidity operations to maintain market functioning and credit availability. The bank has broadened eligible collateral for its term repo facility to help maintain funding conditions by providing a backstop to regular private funding. These will complement the reduction in bank capital buffers announced last week by the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. All of these actions will support lending by banks to consumers and companies. The bank is also providing extra support to the Canada mortgage bond market so that this important funding market continues to function well. The first purchase under this new program took place only yesterday. To help the economy cope with the negative shocks of COVID-19 and the recent sharp drop in oil prices, the bank has reduced its benchmark interest rate by 100 basis points in two steps. The first was on March 4th, second time just this past Friday. Our benchmark interest rate now stands at 0.75%. The bank has also broadened the scope of the Government of Canada bond buyback program, added new term repo operations, and introduced a new banker's acceptance purchase facility that starts next Monday, March the 23rd. In the days to come, the bank will launch its new standing term liquidity facility. This new funding mechanism is focused on individual financial institutions rather than on the market as a whole. It's intended to give an eligible institution that is viable but facing a sudden stress to its liquidity access to central bank liquidity on terms that are known in advance. The Governing Council hopes that institutions facing liquidity issues will make use of this new facility. Canadian banks also conduct parts of their business in U.S. dollars. And on the weekend, the Bank of Canada joined with its counterparts in the U.K., Japan, Europe, the U.S., and Switzerland on a coordinated action to provide liquidity via standing U.S. dollar liquidity swap line arrangements. La Banque du Canada, Men des Actions Concertes, the Bank of Canada is undertaking concerted actions to support the Canadian economy in this time of economic stress. We have introduced these new measures and we are monitoring how the markets are improving. We are also closely monitoring market trends and we are prepared to provide all the liquidity that the financial system requires so that it can continue to serve Canadians. Concerted action to support the Canadian economy during this period of economic stress. We've introduced these new measures and we're watching how market performance improves. We're closely monitoring market developments and we stand ready to provide all the liquidity the financial system needs so that it can continue to serve Canadians. Minister, back to you. Well, thank you. Earlier I noted that many of the heroes of this situation, the people providing medical care we need, food to eat, working phones and internet, clean spaces, let's make sure that we give them the support that they need. Journalists are also doing extraordinary work to keep Canadians informed in this rapidly changing situation. I do want to note the work of Governor Polos, my colleagues, especially the Prime Minister, 
who's reacted to this unprecedented situation with strong leadership, compassion, and a focus on taking concrete actions to help Canadians. There are, though, still many things that we do not know. But to do, we do know one thing, and that is that together we will get through this challenge. Lorsque le moment sera venu, when the time comes, we will ensure more longer-term investments to help Canadians to get their daily life back. But what is the most important thing today is that we take care of each other, that we protect the most vulnerable among us, and that we continue to use all the tools available to stabilize our economy. The government will be there with you at every stage. Only a first step in our plan. When the time is right, we will announce more long-term investments to assist with recovery and help Canadians get back to their daily lives. But what matters most today is that we look after each other, that we protect those who are most vulnerable, and that we continue to use all of the tools we have to stabilize our economy. The government will be there with you every step along the way. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions from the journalists here. Hi, everyone. So we will be working lots of three questions. We'll start by three questions in the room, then we'll go to the phone and come back. Thank you. Um, where's... Your hand up as well. There you go. So I'll just point... Sorry. Let's go. Let's start here. Uh, Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, though. Uh, Kelsey Johnson with Reuters. Um, Governor Pola's uh, first question to you. The Federal, the Federal Reserve over the weekend cut by 100 basis points to essentially make their rate zero. Why is the Bank of Canada not matching the Federal Reserve's rate cut at this point? Well, as is always the case, uh, we have independent monetary policies on the two sides of the border. Um, we were anxious to see the uh, details of the fiscal uh, policy that was just announced for you. Uh, we'll be taking those actions in fully into account in our estimates of how the economy will fare. Uh, I will say that uh, one of the most desirable features of these actions today are that they are what I would call uh, elastic. I hope you don't mind, Minister, if I coin a phrase, but I, what I think they're designed to do is to expand or not, depending on how large of a, an impact there is on the economy, how many people are affected. And so uh, that's, that's a very desirable feature, and that's something we need to model in. Uh, up, we're updating our forecasts uh, as, as we speak. Uh, bank staff are fully engaged, um, even though they're remote, working from home. Our systems are functioning very well, and 1,500 people are on their, uh, logged on our systems remotely. Uh, and so uh, uh, April 15th is our next announcement date, uh, so I'd like to have a f the full benefit of the analysis, especially, as I said, incorporating the, uh, the fiscal response into that analysis. And um, so f for now, that's, uh, that's what I'll say about uh, interest rates. Mr. Morneau, you, you mentioned that EDC is working on specific packages for industries that will be particularly hard hit, like airlines. Can you give a bit more detail as to as to what that package may look like, um, how long it may take to get that package in place? Because as you mentioned, there are significant industries that are in a in a crisis point at this point. Let me step to the the broader concern we have to support businesses at this time. Obviously, we are concerned that people stay at their jobs. As they, as they are able to do that uh, with their employer. And for that reason, we want to make sure that we are supporting companies through this challenging time. The first place we've done that, obviously, has been through uh, providing loan opportunities for uh, small and medium-sized businesses through the Business Credit Availability Program. That's very important. What we're doing today is we're giving temporary wage subsidies to businesses so they can keep people on board. And what we know we need to do in the, in the very immediate time frame is to work with uh, businesses that are in impacted sectors. I've already been working uh, with the uh, businesses in the airline sector, spoke to two of the uh, CEOs uh, last evening. 
Uh, we have a team working with uh, businesses in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we recognize that ensuring that we bridge these businesses through this difficult time is critically important. That's what we're working towards. We'll have um, more work to do with these businesses to listen to their challenges and understand how we can create that support as needed. That's coming, uh, coming shortly as we work with them towards that goal. Thank you. Just for the interest of fairness, let's keep it to one question and one follow-up. Yes. I don't see anything for independent workers who might decide to respect the directive and to stay at home, but who don't necessarily have any children, who are not necessarily ill. Is there something in your plan for that? And if not, uh, what do you plan to do about that? Answer. We want to ensure that people who wish to stay home, we want to ensure that they will have the support necessary for that. That means that our uh, emergency support benefit program will be there for them if they wish to, if they must be at home with uh, no source of income if they're in a situation where they don't have enough money. So there will be this emergency support benefit program that will be there for those people if they must be at home. And the details will be coming up in the next day. Thank you. I've heard that the unemployment rate may reach 20 percent. Have you done any estimates with regard to what is coming in that, re in that regard? Answer. We know that with uh, today's challenges, uh, the challenges in the coming weeks and months, there will be uh, difficulties for many businesses uh, throughout uh, the country, and therefore we need a support that protects people who are in this situation. Today, we uh, cannot. Uh, put any forecast in place because the situation is ever changing. That being said, we have an approach, as the governor said, an approach that will be as broad as possible. If there are challenges for people, they will receive the support that they need for them and their families. Thank you. Minister, I was curious about your Indigenous communities funding. Uh, can you please explain um, some examples about what that's actually supposed to be used for, what that looks like, and how is it going to be broken down among First Nations, Inuit and Métis? Is that by a uh, number of people in each population or is that by need? Well, first of all, let me say that what we're trying to do in this time, we're trying to make sure that the people that are impacted, that are directly impacted by uh, this virus, uh, those who want to stay at home uh, because they need to isolate or uh, we've asked to isolate or those who lose their jobs have the support that they need. We also recognize that there are groups of Canadians that are, are particularly vulnerable and uh, people that are in places that are uh, uh, far away from uh, medical care, people who are in places where uh, food security is a challenge are particularly impacted. We recognize that Indigenous and Northern communities are in that category. Uh, we are moving fast in this regard to try and make sure that we've allocated the resources necessary. We recognize that there will be, in, in cases like supporting Indigenous and Northern communities, there'll be, there'll be details that we need to continue to work out. Uh, we need to recognize that, uh, that we don't know all the situations so far and that we need to prepare ourselves for those eventualities. That's what we're doing in the case of, of, uh, of Indigenous peoples, and we're looking forward to working together very rapidly to figure out the details that, that really constitute your question. Uh, I assume from that answer that you're leaning more toward Indigenous and Northern communities as opposed to urban Indigenous communities. Would that be correct? I think you should um, not make any assumptions at this stage. Uh, we're going to be very clear and transparent with Canadians about what we know and what we don't know. What we're clear today is that we're providing support for people that we know are impacted. What we're going to continue to do is to support Canadians through a difficult time. And as situations evolve and develop, uh, we will be there for Canadians, Canadians in all different situations. And that's what we're reflecting today in our, in our approach. And uh, the goal we, we have is to 
make sure we have the right resources at the right time for the challenges we're facing. Right now, we're facing a situation where Canadians need to know that they have access to medical care. They need to know they have access to food and the essentials that they require. There'll be a next phase where we might continue to need to support people and make investments to ensure that we can actually come out of this challenge. So there will be more to come. Thank you. So we'll go over the phone. Juliana? Certainly. You may now press star one to ask your question. The first question is from Bill Curry from the Globe and Mail. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, Minister. You'd mentioned uh, you're working with the oil and gas sector and there might be something on oil from wells coming, but what about governments uh, in oil producing provinces? You've been in talks for several uh, months about fiscal stabilization measures. Uh, we know Newfoundland is in particular uh, fiscal problems. So uh, where are you at in terms of uh, action in response to demands from oil producing provinces? Well, thank you for the question. We know that there are going to be things emerge through this challenge that, uh, that are unpredictable. Uh, but some things we, we, can, we can see right off. We know that uh, there will be challenges in Alberta because of the significant impact not only of this virus, but also the impact of the uh, oil prices that we're seeing around the world. That will also have impacts on the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, as mentioned. Uh, we're going to work through these challenges individually with provinces as they emerge, uh, recognizing that what, what we want is to come out of this challenge. This is a temporary challenge, a, a, a difficult issue for us, but a temporary challenge, one that we need to come out of strong, and that's uh, going to be our approach. So we will work with provinces as they come to us with their issues in a way that is uh, protecting uh, the citizens of each, each part of our country and ensuring that we have the capacity to move forward once we're through this, this issue. Do you have a follow-up, sir? Yes, um, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, uh, their reaction is questioning why the support is at 10% uh, when other countries like Denmark are at 75%. And uh, for the governor, if he could uh, weigh in as well, you mentioned the next rate announcement is April 15. What would it take for you to move before that uh, scheduled announcement? Let me just address the approach we've taken uh, today. We want to make very sure that people have access to financial resources in a time of real need. We know that people are concerned about having access to uh, enough money for essentials, for, for medicines, for health care, for, uh, for any form of, of food or lodging. These are critically important, and so we focused our approach on having enough money delivered at the right time so people can actually deal with the, the issues that, that they are facing. We also know that businesses need some support. So we've taken an approach that allows for significant support for businesses right now through a temporary wage subsidy and also a significant support uh, for businesses as they seek to have credit to make it through a difficult time. Uh, we don't take anything off the table. So we are going to continue to consider the emerging evidence of, of these challenges and uh, respond in a way that meets the goals that we're all trying to achieve, to keep ourselves safe and healthy, to enable us to have our families uh, with the things that they need, and to come out of this uh, strong so that we can uh, revive our economy at the appropriate time. Thank you. Next person. Ah. Thank you. The next question is from Gloria Galloway from Mays News. Your line is open. Uh, hello, my question is for Governor Polas. Um, what additional measures is the bank considering to bolster the economy, and is quantitative easing among them? Well, thank you. Uh, and let me just answer Bill's question, uh, Bill Curry's question, uh, just before I turn to yours, because uh, they are contextual. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was being fairly careful to not rule out uh, actions at any time, it was nothing scripted about the bank's uh, posture. I only mentioned that between now and April 15th, we'll be doing our usual analysis and producing a monetary policy report. Uh, the bank staff are hard on that. And uh, one of the big changes that we've got to incorporate in that is this major fiscal announcement that we've just seen. Um, it's uh, so, you know, I'm not going to itemize what, what could cause us to, uh, to move earlier or not move earlier. 
at this stage. What I think, uh, and coming blending that with the next question, um, we've we've made a lot of uh, moves in just a few days, uh, as I itemized. And just to give you an illustration, I mean, I, I know it sounds quite theoretical to people. Oh, we have a different repo program or different collateral. Uh, just to illustrate what that might mean, uh, just yesterday, uh, the bank did about just under $35 billion of unusual or, or uh, say, quite exceptional transactions. Um, and that's across a wide range of programs, some of which we had never done before. So I'm very proud of the trading room folks that are getting these things done at a time, especially when we've split our operations into three different locations for health uh, safety reasons. Um, and everything's functioning terrifically. I'm, I'm knocking on wood there. But for example, we did uh, our first purchase in the secondary market of Canada mortgage bonds yesterday. Spreads on Canada mortgage bonds have come down from, you know, in the almost 70 basis points to around 50 basis points. These are on 10 years. That's a really significant move in the markets and it's an indicator that that, that action is helping to ease tensions out there. And as I said, this is all aimed at keeping credit channels open so that, uh, you know, we are out, out there, businesses and, and households have lines of credit with banks. And what we want to make sure is that the system functions well so the banks are still in a position to continue to offer that credit to people when they actually need it, uh, which is in a, in a situation like this. So uh, that back plumbing sort of uh, action that we're taking uh, is very important, and uh, some of these things are just getting underway. So I think it's important for us to take some time here to watch those things unfold and see how the market functions. What other tools do we have? Well, they're the same ones that we've laid out in the past under our extraordinary uh, measures. They are all still in the toolkit. But I think the main thing is that uh, it's, most of these things are scaled, that is, are scalable. So we've sort of started out with a certain number of, as I said, for example, $35 billion yesterday. That's a lot for one day worth of transactions. But we will scale that as needed. Whatever the system needs, that's, that's, this is what we will provide. And uh, we'll continue to evolve perhaps uh, elements of the programs to make them more tailored if need be. But for now, we've got a lot in place, and we want to see how it functions. It seems to be functioning well uh, so far. Follow up? Uh, I, I take it that means you're not ruling out quantitative easing. I would certainly not rule out quantitative easing. Of course not. Um, and uh, that that is just something that's a, a standard part of the central bank toolkit. Um, I would say, though, that the things that we are doing uh, right now, that is actively uh, operating in uh, various bond uh, markets, and uh, we're just about to start uh, next week, um, our, our bank, bankers acceptance uh, uh, program. Well, those, those things may appear to you as a sort of quantitative easing, but they are, they are not. They are, they are just intended to help markets. Uh, discover prices more readily when the bond market is dysfunctional. Uh, people can't, uh, they get big bid-ask spreads and the market kind of freezes up. So by doing switches and buybacks, the bank can show itself and, and show guidance into an equilibrium so we get uh, more rapid uh, turnover in the market. So all those things are going hand in hand to make sure the, I feel like the plumbing is working well. Uh, and that means that the rest of the delivery system that's going on uh, can do its job. The one before going back to the room. The next question is from Chris Varko from the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hi, Minister Morneau. I just want to know what kind of assistance are you looking at for the airlines and for the oil and gas sector? Would this be part of the $10 billion liquidity measures that were announced last week, or would they provide a different kind of assistance? Are you looking at things like loan guarantees, direct investments? Thank you. We recognize that through the course of this, uh, this uh, virus, we are going to face uh, different challenges from different sectors, different challenges from different sizes of business. 
Uh, we are not ruling out any conclusion in any situation. We're going to actively work with uh, organizations in the oil and gas sector, in the airline uh, sector, in order to come up with approaches that enable them to bridge through a challenging time. That's critical. <clears throat> We're not far enough along in those discussions to uh, identify specific measures that we will take, but we do recognize the urgency of those discussions and are proceeding with that in mind. And your follow-up? Nope. Okay, in that case, we'll be going back to the room. Uh, Monsieur Blouin, Radio Canada. Is there anything specific for the seniors? For example, would there be any changes to uh, OAS rapidly? Is what about for seniors who are particularly vulnerable? Thank you. We know that there are challenges for all Canadians across the country. Of course, the challenge is more difficult for people who are in a, pison, are in a position where they receive less income because of COVID. We want to ensure that our approach is continuing so seniors can rest assured that they will uh, keep the, the income that they're receiving. But we have particular challenge, challenges, for example, with the change in market prices. There are uh, difficulties for some seniors, and that is why we have introduced an approach that will help people who want to rest assured that they can continue with their, uh, uh, to receive their income in future. So we're trying to monitor the situation. If there is something specific that is required, then we will step up. You've talked about an easing of the rules in order to receive EI benefits. And there are also people who have called for an enhancement of these benefits. Why are you choosing not to go in that direction? Answer. The most important thing immediately is that we have to keep in mind people who are not part, who do not qualify for EI benefits, even if they are having problems. And that is why we are considering how we can ensure that the $5.7 million of the 19 of our 19 million workers are going to receive something that is very important but we have also done things to help a vast majority of Canadians our credit pro approach with the uh, uh, GST is going to help some 15 million dollars, or uh, rather Canadians, and uh, we've also uh, got this uh, enhanced CCC benefit that will help 3.4 million families across Canada. So we have uh, specific measures uh, for a large number of Canadians. And uh, altogether, this is a very comprehensive approach for people who are in situations where they may not be receiving sufficient income. Thank you. For Canadians to get money in their pockets. We've worked hard uh, to make sure that the approaches that we're taking will enable us to move forward uh, as rapidly as possible. This has been a, a, a key area of focus. Certainly the Prime Minister has been very engaged in this discussion with me. Uh, we've looked at both the systems that we currently have in government, like the employment insurance system, and the systems that we have that can enable us to get money out quickly. It's, it's why we've come to the measures that we've come to, because they enable us to get money out rapidly. So we will be working through the Canada Revenue Agency primarily for the GST uh, credit that will enable us to get that out uh, fairly rapidly, we believe in April, uh, for the um, approach, the emergency uh, benefits that we've talked about, those benefits will be able to be out within 
within a, a, a couple to three weeks, very rapidly. We're, we're putting up an automatic system so people can go online to the CRA to actually apply with a very, very modest approach to showing that they have the appropriate situation. And uh, that, we think, will enable people to get money in their, in their family finances uh, very rapidly. And are you concerned about the optics of closing the U.S.-Canadian border to non-essential travel, that it may lead to consumers, you know, panic shopping or, uh, you know, hoarding groceries more uh, or other supplies? How do you combat that? And as well, um, as well can the cross-border supply chain, is it resilient enough to maintain that kind of a shock for an extended period of time? We've, we've been working very hard with the U.S. administration in recent days to make sure we come up with an approach that ensures that we can continue to have the, the goods and the, the things that we need, the essential medicines, the, the food, come back and forth across our border, that our broader supply chains can, can continue, because we want that to uh, be able to maintain our economy now and to allow us to, to get back to where we, we want to get back to once we're past this crisis. Uh, I think what we've come to is, is, a, is a very good conclusion, that we will enable non-essential non uh, workers and travelers. They, those people will not be able to cross the border, but essential workers, people that might be working in Windsor uh, from Detroit or people working in Detroit that are from Windsor, they will be able to go back and forth if they're in the healthcare sector. We'll be able to ensure that, that goods and services can, can come, on, come back and forth because our economies will, uh, will need that, uh, that economic travel. But other travel won't be moving back and forth. That, uh, that was an, um, an important discussion between uh, the Prime Minister and the President. Uh, we're confident that that will give Canadians confidence that we'll continue to have what we need. And uh, we will be uh, continuing to work together in a, in a cooperative way as we try uh, our best to, to deal with everything as, a, as it comes up. And that's, that's the approach we've taken and will continue to take. Hi, Minister Morneau. Uh, Molly Thomas from CTV National News. Um, you said your focus is for Canadians to keep food in the fridge and a roof over their heads. So we know that the banks are deferring mortgage payments. I mean, but what about people that don't own a home? What about people um, that are struggling to pay rent in this time? What are you doing for them? Well, that's particularly important. We we know that there's there's many different situations for uh, for as many different Canadians as as exist, and we are trying to ensure that we we deal with the most urgent and important uh, right up front. And that's why we've those those 5.7 million people who aren't in the employment insurance system, those uh, those people are very important for us to deal with right up. So if they're sick or if they're quarantined or if they uh, they are laid off or, or can't work and therefore aren't getting paid, they will have access to funds. The GST low income credit, which will be providing a significant amount of support for, for lower income Canadians, it's a, a benefit that provides everyone with a family income up to about $56,000 with, with support, that will help as well. So. Uh, we are doing our best to make sure that we get the, the funds to the people who, who need it most on an urgent basis, and uh, we believe that's the, that's the right way to deal with this challenge. And we'll continue to think about other methods to get money to people, but we believe these are the fastest way to get the appropriate amount of funds to the people who are most in need. Bind was 2008, obviously. Um, are we looking at a worse financial quarter to come? Uh, then after that, and maybe Governor Polaz can also weigh in on that. I, I think it's important that we, we tell Canadians what we know and what we don't know. We, we, we can't know the, the full impact or the duration of the challenge we're facing. We do know that we have uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, health care system in the world to deal with this crisis. We do know that we actually have perhaps the, the best banking system in the world to make sure that businesses can still get credit. We have a very strong fiscal position that we're willing to use. So we know that we've got the tools to deal with this. We also know that we have a, a strong and, and well-educated workforce to come out of this when the time comes. And we'll support people along the way to get there. Uh, as we know more, we will be telling Canadians uh, exactly what we know, and we will be supporting them with measures that are appropriate to the challenges that we come up against. That's what we're trying to do today, and we'll continue with that approach. So, um, sorry. Um, you know, I think uh, the minister said, well, we honestly don't know what's, what's coming our way. Uh, 
fact is, back then, we didn't know what was coming our way either. Um, but I would say that uh, one thing you mentioned, which is a, a worth emphasizing, that is we actually do have the best banking system in the world. And it is indeed vastly strengthened compared to uh, 12 years ago uh, because of uh, new global standards. And, uh, and I think also lessons that were learned uh, during that period. And those lessons were learned not just by the lenders, but they were learned by the policymakers. So uh, personally, I have great comfort from the seasoned people who I've got around me uh, who uh, were living through that. At the time, I was making loans at EDC. Uh, but, uh, but, for example, Carolyn Wilkins was in the trench developing new uh, capital arrangements, uh, new collateral arrangements, new lines to, uh, to uh, help the situation under Governor Carney. And there she is today doing exactly the same thing behind the scenes. Uh, that sort of thing gives, gives me a lot of confidence that, in fact, um, we, are, we are in a better position today in the financial system. Uh, and we're ahead. We're ahead in terms of the deployment of those tools compared to uh, back back in 2008. Um, again, I put that up against. We don't actually know what's what's coming our way, of course. Uh, but I think we've got the ability to be nimble and, and adaptable to it. And uh, this this uh, fiscal package is uh, going to make a really big difference to uh, to the way you you vision how that would play out. So. I think uh, the other thing we, we want to prepare for the other side, we know that this is a temporary thing. We don't know how long or how big, but it's it's temporary. And uh, I know we're, we're, we enter this at a time when the economy was in the best place it had been for a really long time, with unemployment at historic lows and inflation on target and so on. Those are those are in a, in a strong fiscal position. So all those things uh, make a really big difference to how we will recover afterwards. So I think we can certainly uh, look forward to a robust recovery when when the trouble is behind us. So we'll go back to the phone, but in the interest of time, we'll only take two questions on the phone and then two questions in the audience. Juliana? So to me, the next question is from Kim McHale from the Wall Street Journal. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. This question is for Governor Polas. Uh, Governor, I'm wondering if you could describe uh, how Governing Council is communicating at this stage, if things have changed uh, in terms of whether you're meeting in person, your communications have moved to a different format, and, um, and how often you're meeting, and when the last meeting was. Okay, well, we're we're in pretty constant touch. Uh, we we met yesterday. Um, we are uh, we met though mostly virtually. Uh, for for certain, uh, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I are maintaining our distance. Uh, should either one of us become ill, that we don't uh, affect the other. Uh, one of our deputy governors uh, went home and stayed home uh, um, last week, and a second one who lives in Vancouver is staying home. So we're we're completely there's only at most a couple of deputy governors in the building uh, at any one time, and uh, the building's mostly empty except for the operational staff I mentioned uh, before. Uh, anyway, so we're meeting uh, more or less continuously, like the uh, both on the virt on virtual. Uh, the, uh, the Skyping is working extraordinarily well. My compliments to Bell Canada. I had a couple, I was on the phone all day yesterday, and only once did I fail to get a call through. Um, went to my landline and it worked right away. But, uh, and so the system must be taking a terrific uh, amount of traffic uh, in this situation. Um, and so all that to say, we're in constant touch. And we're also in uh, very frequent touch with our G7 colleagues. And uh, we're meeting uh, twice a week uh, with the, the, the big six uh, CEOs of the, uh, the large banks um, to, to get a feel for that. And, of course, our market intelligence people are in constant contact uh, with the street. And, uh, and our, of course, our operational people are in the market uh, every minute. And so uh, we're getting a constant play-by-play -play globally and domestically. Um, it's, uh, I'd say, in that, in that sense, operationally, it's working extraordinarily well. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, 
uh, let's just look forward, as I said before, to how all these things we're doing that are different from before, how they play out. Uh, fundamentally, it's about the, the, our financial system having access to funding and being able to continue to uh, get things working out through the system. People need it to get it. Thank you. Thanks. And, and can I ask, during your discussion, the discussion the Governing Council held yesterday, uh, did you discuss the possibility of a rate cut today? Uh, I don't want to front run what our, I mean, our discussions at this stage are, it's like a continuous dialogue. It's, it's not like we're, um, you know, saying, well, let's talk about this on Friday or, or on Monday or that sort of thing. We're just talking continuously. Um, we're uh, developing these new uh, tools. We're commenting to one another. What have we forgotten? What haven't we done? Uh, so that uh, there's, there, right now, um, you know, we'll just be we'll be in touch all the time, and we we'll be able to say conditions have changed enough that we perhaps should have a conversation about this. So I won't need to organize a formal meeting. Everybody's available. For one thing, travels where nobody's traveling anywhere, so it is actually more available than usual. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Next question. The next question is from Catherine Lévesque de La Presse Canadienne. Votre ligne est ouverte. Oui, bonjour. Uh, J'avais une question pour Monsieur. Good Morneau. afternoon. I have a question uh, for Minister Mornot. If we look at the detail de of the uh, emergency care benefit, people have to prove every two weeks that they're still eligible. So I was wondering why they don't. Or why or are you considering uh, easing those options? because some people may have uh, difficulty contacting CRA. So uh, perhaps some emergency aid should be uh, dispensed. Thank you very much. We wish to have an approach that uh, works very nimbly. We think that we have found the right approach, which means that there will be a very short attestation to ensure that the the person in question is indeed in a situation where they require income, and then we will have an automatic with an with the the CRA. There will be an automatic payment so that they can receive the payment immediately. So this is an approach that we think will work. If there are challenges, because while well, it's the first time we view such an approach, we will rectify it uh, as soon as possible. And so we, we will be there for Canadians. We will uh, be there as quickly as possible with uh, the tools required. Thank you. Thank you. My follow up question is well, most of the uh, measures announced today today are direct support. This will require adoption by Parliament and Royal Assent. What is going to happen to ensure that uh, this is going to happen as quickly as possible? What is your message? Answer. I'd like to tell the other political parties, uh, I'd like to say that uh, they are working very closely with the government. And we have received a number of recommendations. And in my opinion, we all realize that we need an approach that is going to be in place as quickly as possible. And in my opinion, we will be back to Parliament very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are coming back to the room, sir. Uh, Governor, can I ask you, I'm just looking for a figure. Uh, on purchase of bankers' acceptance notes, municipal and corporate bonds, what's the ceiling? Uh, we, have not, uh, we have not laid out our parameters around that yet, uh, but it'll be judged according to need. Okay, well, what our objective will be market functioning. Uh, and so if, if the market needs uh, only a small amount of activity from us to function well, then it'll be a small amount. But uh, 
And we'll start off with, you know, I think pretty large numbers, and uh, it's more a question of what take up there is. It's like a, it's like a reverse auction. So you, you put out, you say well, we're willing to take up to this much, and see what the response is. So it's more like, what does the market require in order to uh, get through its, uh, get through its business week? Um, so that's to begin next week, and. Um, and you know, I mean, it's, it, I hesitate to use the the you know extreme words around this, but just say like all of these things we've done around uh, around uh, repos and other forms of lending or involvement in the actual secondary markets, um, we we can scale those up as much as needed. Okay, so there's there's uh, there's all kinds of capacity to to make them as big. Uh, as as seems to be needed at the time, so we don't have to worry about. Like, people are asking, can, is there more you can do? Well, yeah, you can you can do everything much bigger one week and not as big the next. It just depends on what the market requires. And Minister, you've uh, been told by CFIB that businesses uh, will be failing, but the carbon tax goes up at the start of the fiscal year. Uh, you've been told by CFIB that people will lose their jobs, but MPs will be getting a cost of living increase on April 1st. Carbon tax, cost of living increase, will you defer those or repeal them on April 1st to set an example? I think um, it's important to uh, to note that we've, you know, we've been working together with um, with the other parties. Uh, we, I've asked uh, the President of the Canadian Labour Congress and the President of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce are both here with us today. We've been working together with Labour and with business to work on an approach that's going to deliver the support that Canadians need right now. And by that I mean the support that people need to deal with this immediate challenge. So we've uh, had uh, recommendations from both the Canadian Labour Congress and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Congress, uh, Canadian Chamber, on, on approaches we can take to deal with both how we support people and how we support businesses through a very challenging time. Uh, we've embraced the approaches that they've they've recommended recommended because we've seen them as being very sensible uh, approaches, things that we can implement rapidly. We've also um, taken and embraced the approaches proposed by the other parties. I think there's been a, a good level of collaboration and understanding that we need to deal with the the challenges in the in the immediate term that are that are right here in front of us, and we need to ensure that we get to the challenges that will be the next set of challenges when those uh, present themselves. Uh, that's why I'm 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 pleased with where we've gotten to, but I'm uh, will have to acknowledge that we will. Uh, remain open to considering what the next steps should be based on uh, how the situation evolves. Uh, our approach, as the governor mentioned, is elastic. If we find that we have uh, more people with challenges, we are we are uh, taking the measures that mean that people can have access to money, irrespective of of how long that goes, because we we're going to have to reconsider the information as it comes out, um, and that's that's going to be quite important for dealing with this challenge. Uh, so, um, I want Canadians to know that we will continue to support them, that, uh, that in a challenging time, the government will be there for them. Thank you. And for our last question, Madame Lamarche TVA. D'abord, pour vous, vous dites qu'il reste beaucoup de travail législatif. You are saying that there is a great deal of legislative work uh, that remains before being able to put all of these measures in place. You're talking about three weeks for the emergency care benefit. Are you confident that you can do that in three weeks? And for the other measures, how long will they take? Answer. We have already begun our approach with regard to administration, which means that over past weeks we've been working to ensure that we have the facility, the capacity, to pay the money out to people, and that is very important. We have to have the legislation, obviously. That must be adopted, and that's why it's important to work with other parties. And in my opinion, we'll be in a very good position to do so in coming days. So we have an approach. We have the possibility of uh, taking robust measures, and we're going to be very transparent with Canadians to ensure every day to 
monitor where we're at and to ensure that Canadians can have the trust, can trust us to receive the, the income that they require to meet their needs. Question inaudible for the interpreter. Answer, well, if we can do it before three weeks, uh, we will do so. If we need to take the full three weeks, we will. But uh, please rest assured that we're working every single day to find ways of administering what we're doing as possible. What, how do you evaluate the costs of ensuring the changes at the border? For example, will uh, supply chains continue to work? How is it going to, how much is it going to cost uh, all of these complications at the border, at the U.S. border? Because obviously there will be problems. Answer, our approach with the concerning the U.S. border is to ensure that uh, we make our make Canadians' health a priority and to ensure that our health care system works. I think that we found the right approach. We are going to continue with uh, essential uh, circulation, but we're going to tell Canadians and Americans that they must stay at home except in cases of non-essential travel. With regard to our economy, our approach is that we want to continue free trade between ourselves and, and the United States. We cannot be sure right at the moment of what will happen in the future because things are changing every day. But we do have an agreement with the Americans that will ensure that we can, can continue to engage in free trade, which is very important for our economy. Thank you. We, uh, we believe that what we've come up with with the Americans is, is the appropriate approach. We've, we've said that we don't want to have uh, non-essential travel back and forth. So uh, consistent with both countries, we've, we've asked people to stay at home if they, if they can stay at home, uh, if they're not essential workers. That said, we'll allow essential workers uh, to go back and forth. We'll allow for commerce to continue because we know that getting uh, medicine, getting food back and forth across the border is critically important for both countries. And so we've, we've taken a, a practical approach that will protect us and ensure that we, uh, we continue to be able to um, have a, a functioning economy during this challenging time. So with that, I, I'd like to, to thank all of you and, and just to say that what we've tried to do today is to ensure that Canadians have, have confidence, that Canadians have confidence that we are going to uh, protect them and their families, uh, not only their health, but their ability to afford the things that they need at the time they need it. This is a first phase. It's a, it's a very significant phase of, of helping people directly, of helping businesses to bridge a difficult time. But there will be more work to do as we have uh, more information. I've been particularly pleased with the uh, cooperation of the of the other parties. Um, it is uh, it is clear that we all see the importance of working together to to support Canadians, and I'm I'm confident that we'll continue to be able to work together in that regard. I've been particularly pleased to see the Canadian Labour Congress and the the uh, Canadian Chambers of Commerce to work together to come up with ideas that uh, that are supporting Canadians, supporting Canadian businesses, so they can support uh, people. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we have uh, in Canada that is that is so. Uh, we're so fortunate to have. Uh, we will continue to, to take care of Canadians. We ask that people take care of themselves, and uh, the government will be there to support them uh, as we move forward in these challenging times. So, merci beaucoup. Uh, pour être Thank you very aujourd much aujourd for having been Thank here you. today. We'll look forward to continuing to keep you up to date as the situation evolves. Thank you, Governor. All right, that is a very long press conference by the finance minister and the governor of the Bank of Canada. No complaints, though. It was a lots of important information there. One of the central pieces of information is that this injection of, of cash that will be coming directly to your pocket soon and uh, a freeing up of liquidity is is not is only the first step is what the finance minister said in terms of long-term investments to help with the economy and then the subsequent recovery the uh, governor of the bank of canada stephen polas i thought uh, really nailed
nailed the description by saying that these measures are, quote, elastic, that they are designed to expand or not, depending on circumstances. So we can understand $27 billion in direct payments now, $55 billion in deferred uh, tax payments until the end of August. But, but don't think that there isn't the capacity and the ability to do more and to, do, and to go bigger if needed and if Canadians need it. Um, I believe we're standing by now for a press conference uh, with a handful of ministers again and Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. Let me bring in, though, my colleagues, Vashti Capellas and the CBC's David Cochran, uh, who have both been listening closely. We, I mean, it was very, very detailed and it was mm -hmm. trying to get a very uh, broad picture of, of the state of things, I think, on, on both counts. Um, but there was a little bit more information about how the money will be uh, sent to Canadians, how much money will be sent, although it's not going to happen overnight, Vashi. No, it's not going to happen overnight, and it sounds like the best case scenario is in within three weeks, especially for, and, and we've been speaking about this all morning, but those people who have to stay home or have to take sick leave and are not normally qualified or to, to obtain EI, so they wouldn't normally qualify for that program. What the government has introduced today is two separate programs, which they can qualify for, but it sounds like it will take a bit of time to get that going. And I think mm -hmm. our, my colleague David, our colleague David, had flagged that earlier. The administration of all of this is really, I think, where the ball is going, where we have to pay attention now. Are they able to get this money out the door? And if they are, how quickly can they? It's a lot of money, you know, $27 billion when you add up all the various programs. Uh, and it is through programs that already exist to a degree. But these new ones that they mm -hmm. are introducing, I think that's where the real question mark exists for me. And it also offers sort of a study in contrast. We saw while we were listening to Bill Morneau, President Trump was speaking in the United States talking about how they're going to be sending basically a check to every American and he didn't have the exact amounts but he said something along the lines of it sounds like everyone wants to go big and and the uh, the the uh, financial expert we had on earlier was talking about that mm -hmm. they've obviously chosen this approach over the direct to you know here's a check to, for Canadians approach but it will be a study in contrast especially where the administration of this is concerned and that question which is normally a political one or a procedural one isn't really one, one like that for Canadians right now they they need the money now they need it sure. quickly and so do businesses and so I think timing is really going to be something to watch yeah and and the, the first step is to to get it legislated because all of these measures yes. or most of these measures uh, it does require legislation so they'll have to bring Parliament back or a version of Parliament it sounds like there's a, a, a widespread uh, you know cooperation around that from other parties to get it done very quickly but but that also a factor in delaying there are the, the two mechanisms already in place, the child uh, tax benefit uh, and the GST uh, benefit. And the finance minister laid out a little more in detail, David, uh, how, how that will work. Yeah, and Rosie, if I can, I, I'm going to kind of try to pull back and, and maybe grossly oversimplify uh, $82 billion in, in spending, because a lot of the answers that we just listened to were kind of like a Vulcan calculus class mm -hmm, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, essentially what's happened here is, is, is a down payment on the fight against COVID-19, an $82 billion down payment on the fight against it with a promise that whatever it takes to get through this, we can do, and the fiscal capacity and the banking uh, integrity is there for a country to respond. So $27 billion in direct aid so that people have money coming in. $55 billion in tax deferrals, primarily for business, so businesses don't have money going out that they need to survive this next period of time. The big six banks have promised relief on credit lines, credit cards, mortgage payments and student loans are coming from the federal government so you don't have more money that's coming out than necessary and then the governor of the bank of canada has taken a series of measures along with the officer of the superintendent of financial institutions which is essentially the banking regulator to make sure the banks have about 500 billion dollars in credit available to loan to companies to loan to people or to give people relief on things like mortgage payments and, and, and credit line payments so that they can stay afloat i mean that is the big picture theme of what we saw there today of trying to put a safety net a financial safety net under ordinary Canadians, small and medium-sized businesses who are acutely vulnerable to this, and then with the promise of even more to come, particularly for the oil and gas sector, which mm -hmm, is getting mm -hmm, absolutely mm -hmm. slaughtered by this. I've seen in Newfoundland and Labrador, Equinor has just deferred the next offshore oil project there, which was gonna be a lifeline for that particular province, and also promises of help for the airline sectors, with WestJet yeah. suspending international flights and Porter shutting down entirely until June. So. 
The nitty gritty of it all is a lot to absorb, but essentially if you didn't qualify for EI, you will qualify for a version of EI. If you get the GST credit, if you get the Canada Child Benefit, if you get these things, they are going to be boosted and supplemented in the coming months uh, so that you can be kept whole. But Rosie, a, a big thing on this, the IT systems of the government have never been more important. And if you look at the Phoenix payroll system and the challenges we've seen, um, you know, Diane Le Boutelier, the minister responsible for the Canada Revenue Agency, and Anita Anand from Public Procurement, they've got big behind-the-scenes roles that they have to deliver on sure. right now in getting their departments and administrative structures ready to ha get this flood of cash into Canadians' pockets. Vashi, I'll just go back to you before I go to um, our, our financial advisor, just on, on the oil and gas sector, because I know that's an area you also cover closely. Um, it, it didn't, I'm not sure how much I understood there about what is being discussed or how much is needed, but presumably the provinces uh, that, that have or reliant on oil and gas sectors are even going to be further hit because of the, the price of oil. Yeah, and as David mentioned, it's not just uh, Alberta, although it's, it is to a big, a big degree Alberta or to a great degree Alberta, but it's also Newfoundland and Labrador as well as Saskatchewan. I did. I actually heard the promise of more, but the only yeah. specific that I heard really come out was that the government is set to announce a significant, I, I think is how Bill Morneau, the finance minister, described it, investment in orphan well cleanup. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. a suggestion uh, that the, the federal Conservative Party has been making and one of the asks from Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. Of course, he has a longer list of asks that preceded even the impact yes. of the coronavirus yeah. uh, stuff that, that was already due to uh, oil price issues as well as just sort of recession issues in Alberta. He wanted some, somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half billion, nearly two and a half billion dollars in retroactive payments. Uh, that was, you know, months ago when the economy wasn't even <laughs> yeah. doing as badly. So I didn't hear anything any, about that specifically or maybe even more specifically for what Newfoundland and Labrador might need. There was a sort of general promise that they acknowledge the sector is being hit and mm -hmm. that there will be something more for them. But I, the only specific I heard was that there would be uh, some kind of investment in the coming days announced where orphan well cleanup is concerned. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave you both just for a moment and go back to Gareth Watson in Toronto, who has sat there all that time for us, uh, which I appreciate. He's a wealth advisor at Richardson GMP, a wealth management firm. Thanks, thanks for sitting there. Um, wh no what did you What did you hear there that was um, maybe reassuring to you from either the governor or the the minister? Well, if I can do, I'll just have three key themes from this morning just yeah. to kind of summarize all the fine details. Number one is liquidity, which we talked about in the last segment about keeping money in the pockets of Canadians. They're trying their very best to do that with all these different programs that are being rolled out today. Number two is implementation. David's already kind of talked about this. How does this actually work? How does it actually get the money to the people? I'm very interested to see how this works with the banks. I mean, do I qualify for mortgage deferral? Do you? What are the rules? Is it income based? And all those details still have to come out. Number three is timing, of course, getting the money into people's hands. And it looks like two to three weeks is the most optimistic uh, time frame here. But also the timing about when this whole uh, coronavirus situation dissipates. And the only way you can ask the question of whether today is enough is if you take it into context of timing. You can answer, is it enough if this is done by March 31st, which we know is not the case? Is this enough if it's done by April 30th, which we know will not be the case? At what point it all has to be taken into a context of a time frame and we simply don't have the answer, which is also what the market's dealing with. And, you know, at the end of the day, I've already mentioned earlier today, you know, these, these are, these are um, solutions to try and get us through this. They're not solutions to the overall problem that lies in our hands. And yeah. As a, a meme out there said, you know, our grandparents were asked to go to war to fight for our rights and freedoms, and we're being asked to sit on a couch. So I'm hoping <laughs> the Canadians will be part of a solution as opposed yeah. to part of a problem. But if there's one positive takeaway, uh, we have a playbook. It's not the perfect playbook to repeat this time around, but when you look at Governor Paul, as he made some comments today, which I thought were reassuring, which is we've seen some of this before. Last time, basically, everyone around the world were throwing solutions at the problem and hoping that they'd stick. At least we have some experience in dealing with this, and we're not going to necessarily nail it 100%, okay. but at least we're in a better position to address some of these problems that, you know, historically before we hadn't seen until, you know, 2008, 2009. It's not necessarily repetition, but mm -hmm. at least we have some sort of handbook to come from. Gareth Watson, thank you for sticking around for so long and weighing in. Do appreciate your time today very much, sir. Uh, Gareth Watson, the Wealth Advisor at Richardson GMP. We reached him in Toronto. As you can see there on your screen, though, the Deputy Prime Minister and a handful of ministers now beginning their daily briefing. Let's listen in and get the latest information on uh, updates about the COVID-19. The U.S.-Canada border is the symbol of an unprecedented partnership that... Uh, 
that secures our both both of our populations. Every day, two point seven dollars. $2.7 billion worth of uh, goods and services cross the borders, and this is essential to our trading partnership in both, country, in both countries. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic that is currently affecting us in Canada and the United States, we have both agreed to restrict non-essential travel across our border. Travelers will no longer be authorized to cross the border for recreational or tourism purposes. In both of our countries, we are encouraging people to stay home. This measure, this collaborative measure, is reciprocal and is part of this prudent approach. Border crossings that are essential will continue. Both the U.S. and Canadian governments are aware of the importance of maintaining essential supply chains. These supply chains allow us to uh, ensure that uh, food and medication that is indispensable for Canadians and Americans to cross the border. These supply chains, including trucking, will not be affected by this new measure. Canadians and Americans are both crossing borders every day to carry out essential work or for other urgent and essential reasons, and that will not change. Thus, both Canada and the United States will restrict non-essential travel across the Canada-U.S. border. The Canada-U.S. border represents a unique relationship between our countries and our people. $2.7 billion in trade crosses the border every day, and that trade is essential to the economies and well-being of both Canadians and Americans. In response to the ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic, Canada and the United States are temporarily restricting all non-essential travel across the Canada-U.S. border. Travelers will no longer be permitted to cross the border for recreation or tourism. In both of our countries, we are encouraging people to stay home. This collaborative and reciprocal measure is an extension of that prudent approach. Essential travel will continue unimpeded. The Canadian and U.S. governments recognize that it is critical for us to preserve supply chains between our two countries. These supply chains ensure that food, fuel, and life-saving medicines reach people on both sides of the border. Supply chains, including trucking, will not be affected by this new measure. Canadians and Americans also cross the border every day to do essential work or for other urgent or essential reasons. That will not be affected either. Therefore, Canada and the United States will temporarily restrict all non-essential travel across the Canada-U.S. border. Uh, now, let me just add that this agreement was concluded this morning in a phone call between the Prime Minister and the President. I spoke twice yesterday with Vice President Mike Pence and this morning with Secretary Pompeo. Uh, Minister Blair uh, has been speaking often with his U.S. counterpart, Secretary Wolf, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and he will speak further about that. Uh, this morning, I also held a phone call with all of the premiers of the provinces and territories. We spoke about this uh, and many other issues. Later today, my colleague Jean-Yves Duclos and I will be having a conversation with the leaders of the opposition. Uh, let me just conclude uh, by saying that we all now know that the advice of our experts is that this situation will get worse before it gets better. What is also true is that, as a country, we are rising to the challenge. 
individually, collectively. We can do this. Let's take care of ourselves and each other. Everyone who can stay home should stay home. The decisions that each one of us takes today will save lives. So now let me turn to, uh, we will hear this morning from the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Bill Blair. Then we will hear from our <coughs> inspirational Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, and from our Chief Public Health, Health Officer, Dr. Tam, and from our Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. New. Uh, après ça, on va écouter le leader de we will then hear from the uh, government house leader and uh, Quebec le Lieutenant Pablo Rodriguez. Well, thank you very much, Christy, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as the Deputy Prime Minister has, has said, w this is a very important day uh, for Canadians and in our relationship with our American neighbours. The longest undefended border in the world is a border that we share, and, and both of our countries acknowledge and recognize how our economies are integrated and how important it is that we work so collaboratively together um, in maintaining the integrity of that border, but also in maintaining the essential trade activity that takes place between our two countries. It is essential not just for us, but for our American allies, and, and it's important is recognized in the agreement we have made today, together today. It's an acknowledgement that that trade is essential and needs to continue in these very difficult and trying times. And so while I think the announcement is, is quite clearly focused, as the Prime Minister announced earlier today, that we have agreed to temporarily restrict all non-essential travel across the Canada-U.S. border, it's equally important to acknowledge that what we have also achieved is we have secured those vital economic supply lines that will be absolutely essential not only in maintaining the health and safety of Canadians throughout this crisis, but also assist greatly in the economic recovery that must surely follow. Let me explain a little bit about what this actually will mean to travellers. It means that travelers will no longer be permitted to cross the border between Canada and the United States for things like recreation and tourism. But, on, but essential travel will continue unimpeded. We recognize, as I've said, the critical importance of, of maintaining supply lines between our countries. But it's also important to recognize that Canadians and Americans cross this border every day to do essential work and for other urgent or essential reasons, and these will not be impacted. We know, for example, there are many border cities where citizens on one side of the border travel each day across that border to work in our hospitals and to provide other essential services. And we have to make sure that those people can get to work to do the job of keeping Canadians safe because their work will be important to save lives. We also know that that, that, that others are impacted. And for example, international students, workers with visas, temporary foreign workers, their, their work is important to maintaining our country and, and, the, the, and the, what they contribute. And so they'll be allowed to enter Canada as well after observing the 14-day period of self-isolation. Other measures have been and will continue to be targeted and effective while ensuring the protection of Canadians' health and safety, which is our first and greatest priority. In both of our countries, we are encouraging people to stay home not to engage in unnecessary and non-essential travel. And we believe that today's announcement is a crucial step in our efforts to keep Canadians safe. I think it'd be difficult to imagine two countries that are most, more closely linked and allied through economic integration and friendship than Canada and the United States. We share geography, history, culture, and trade. Our people are linked by our shared values and by our economies. And every day, as Christy has mentioned, Canada and the U.S. do over $2.7 billion in cross-border trade. Our businesses and our way of life depend on the free flow of these goods and services and by the important work of essential workers. And that's why we believe this announcement and what has been achieved in a mutually agreed upon reciprocal agreement with the United States to impose reciprocal measures that will be effective in keeping both of our communities safe. It's about our health and safety and also about our eventual recovery. The entire world is dealing with COVID-19 and Canada and the United States are no exception. But we are working collaboratively together to face this challenge head on. And we have, as with all of our significant global challenges, we do it best when we work together. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Now we'll hear from Patty, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, the everyone. The package and the agreement with our American neighbor announced earlier today are both very important steps to support the health and safety and wellness of all Canadians. So today I want to talk a little bit about another aspect of that, and that's Canada's testing capacity. We've been working around the clock with provinces and territories to make sure everyone has what they need to continue to detect and interrupt the, the chain of transmission. And provinces and territories have been wrapping, ramping up their capacity to do so in incredibly innovative ways. I want to thank them for how quickly they're moving. However, the current situation is constantly evolving, and that's why today we also approved two new diagnostic tests, which will enable provincial labs to test even more quickly. As Dr. Tam has said, early diagnosis is critical to, uh, is a critical component of slowing down the spread of the illness, and Canadians can be encouraged that Canada has been leading in terms of our testing capacity uh, at, uh, I think, 44,000 tests to date. Dr. Tam has the most current numbers. The efforts that we're seeing from Canadians across the country to slow the spread of virus is truly phenomenal. And I know that the changes that we're seeing are overwhelming. Changing our behaviours is not easy, but Canadians all across the country are showing that it's possible. From the small changes like washing our hands more frequently to the large ones like working from home and self-isolating when possible, these actions are all helping our neighbours and our friends and colleagues very much. Merci beaucoup aussi encore pour tous Thank les you also qui don't, qui to all workers who are providing their services in these difficult times. Our petite. current actions, both the small and large, are very important for our families and communities. Thank you. Merci et bonjour à tous. Globally, Thank you and good afternoon. Cases of COVID-19 in over 165 countries. As of right now, there are 598 cases of COVID-19 and eight deaths in Canada. What is most concerning is that over the past week, we've started to see a sharp rise in cases and a number of provinces have reported cases with no links to travel. This is a signal that there is some degree of community spread, so our time to act is now. To find and stamp out community transmission, public health authorities across Canada remain laser focused on detecting and interrupting any change in transmission. Today, we have now done o tested over 50,000 people uh, for COVID-19. En plus. In addition to public health actions, governments, community groups, event organizers and businesses have all banded together to flatten the epidemic curve. Now it is up to the rest of us, and Canadians are embracing the concepts of social distancing, which is all about separating yourself from others physically. All across the country, people are looking at different ways to maintain that two-meter distance by staying home from work and school. But sorry, no playdates, parties or sleepovers. Avoiding public gatherings and crowded spaces. Avoiding public transport where possible. Arranging, arranging to have supplies such as groceries dropped off at the door, separating from others in your home, or rather not having visitors to your home and using online technology to communicate. And if you are an older adult or have a medical condition, keeping that protective space. But by all means, do go out for a walk in the fresh air, as long as you keep to the two-meter rule. And be sure to wash your hands as soon as you go back inside. In addition to public health actions, government, Community groups, event organizers, businesses have all banded together to flatten this epidemic curve. Now it is up to the rest of us, and Canadians are embracing the concept of social distancing, which is all about separating yourself from others physically.
or across the country, people are looking at different ways to maintain that two-meter distance by staying home from work and school. But sorry, no parties or sleepovers. Avoiding public gatherings in crowded spaces. Avoiding public transport or go off peak hours. Arranging to have supplies such as groceries dropped off. Not having visitors to your home. Use technology to connect with families and friends. And if you are an older adult or have a medical condition, keeping that protective space is very important. But please, by all means, go out for a walk in the fresh air. Go to the grocery store, as long as you keep to that two-meter rule, and be sure to wash your hands as soon as you get inside. There will be many inconveniences in our lives in the coming weeks, but it is an opportunity to get creative. Like Canadians who created the caremongering trend, an isolate for love trend, we can do our part in curbing an epidemic while being supportive of each other. So this is our chance right here, right now. Merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam, for that very clear and useful advice. Dr. Gnu, est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à dire? Dr. Gnu, do you have anything to add? Exactly. We, we'd like to hear you speak in French today. Well, I uh, don't have anything else today because uh, Dr. Tam uh, uh, spoke in both official languages, so we're fine. Thank you very much. Pablo, please go ahead. Yesterday, Thank you. I had a first conversation with the position House leaders. We talked about the next steps to recall the House of Commons to bring in emergency economic measures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this morning, we had a conference call with the House leaders, with, with whips from different parties, where we started to discuss the, the logistics uh, around how this will work. Uh, and I want to state very clearly that there is great collaboration amongst all parties. We are working together to respond to this very serious challenge, and we will continue our discuss discussions in this manner. All the parties agreed on the importance of recalling the House of Commons, and I'd like to thank them sincerely for their collaboration. Everyone is doing everything that they can so that this happens quickly, and I expect this to happen next week. I'm very pleased that all parties have been able to work together, especially last week. It was done in an exemplary fashion. We uh, uh, adopted the bills required so that the government could continue to uh, uh, pay out money that's very important for the pandemic. We did a lot last week, but there is still more to do. New laws are required to help all Canadians. Uh, we pass these measures quickly in order to provide support to Canadians in need. And I will continue to engage with the opposition in an open, transparent and collaborative manner. And together we will bring back the House of Commons in a responsible way and work on legislation that will help Canadians through this difficult time. Now, how will this work? The government will write a letter to the Speaker of the House of Commons. It will indicate that in the public interest of the, that the House of Commons be recalled in order to bring in emergency economic measures to help Canadians, to help all Canadians. If the Speaker accepts the request, the House then could be recalled uh, 48 hours later. While the details have not been decided yet, my sense is that it could happen uh, next week. We're actually we're working in that direction. As we know, the House requires a, a quorum of 20 members uh, to sit, and I will continue to discuss with the opposition parties as to the number of members who will be present, a number that respects the proportion of the parties in the House, so that it reflects uh, the composition of the House. Uh, we all saw how quickly the House and the Senate can react to the extraordinary situations by working together in the best interest of Canadians, and the government intends to continue to be open, transparent, and, and share as much information as possible with all MPs, with all senators. And we uh, must be realize that what we're doing is unprecedented, and I want to be clear, we are all united in this crisis. We're going to face it together. We're going to weather it together. That we're all united in this crisis. We will face it together, and we will get through it together. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.
Thank you. Merci, Pablo. Thank you, Pablo. And uh, obviously, ministers Duclos and Garneau are also available, or rather, are also with us. And I know that they will be they will be delighted to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to questions. Ms. Freeland, unless I missed something, a number of you have spoken today, but we still don't know when the border will actually be closed to travelers. I'm talking about the Canada-U.S. border. Can you be clear on that this afternoon? Answer. Yes, I can answer your question. As you know, as the Prime Minister has explained, for us, it was very important to have a coordinated and reciprocal response along with the United States. We are neighbors and partners. As concerns the details, including the matter of when the new measures will be implemented, we are currently confirming that in very close collaboration with our neighbors to the south. But I can tell you right now that it is not the time to travel for non-essential purposes, for tourism or recreation. And uh, we have already made the decision with the U.S. president. We have spoken about this decision, and so has President Trump. Concerning the exact moment as to when this ban will come into place, we're coordinating the exact details right now because, because we have to work with a great number of people who are working every day on the border. And I would also like to say Canadians, to Canadians that we are in an extraordinary times, and in these extraordinary times, it is important to make decisions very swiftly. That's what we have done today and this week. When we make these decisions very swiftly, we think it is important to be honest and open with Canadians, to announce when the decision is made, that the decision has been made, and to be ready and open and to say all the details have not yet been nailed down to the last one, but that it will be done in the, in the hours to come. Just repeat that in English. So in terms of the actual moment of entry into force, um, let me be clear. The decision has been taken, and this is a decision to restrict entry of at the Canadian-U.S. border of both Canadians and Americans traveling across the border for discretionary, non-essential purposes, for example, tourism and recreation. That travel will not be permitted. Uh, the question was, what is the precise moment when these instructions will be enforced at the border? And the answer is, we are still working very energetically with our American colleagues to determine the precise moment when that will be enforced by the hardworking people at the border. But let me be clear. A decision has been taken. It's been announced by our Prime Minister and by the U.S. President. And I would also like to be clear to anyone thinking of making a tourist or recreational trip across the Canadian-U.S. border, please don't do it. It's not good for you. It's not good for your neighbours. And I do also want to say, uh, and I think that Patty has been very good at explaining this to Canadians, we are working right now in an exceptional time. I think we all understand that. And what that means is, as political leaders, we need to operate a little bit differently. We need to be in a position to take decisions very quickly, and we need to be honest and open with Canadians about those decisions. So a clear decision has been taken. Each one of the practical details has not yet been agreed. But even as we are sitting here, that practical work is being done, and the details will be announced as soon as they're confirmed. So, uh, yes, you're talking about being honest. Are you talking about days or weeks? 
Do you mean for the decision? Oh, a number of days, a number of hours or days. Uh, Minister Rodriguez, if the houses were called next week, doesn't that mean that checks will be inaudible for the interpreter? Answer, we are proceeding as quickly as possible. I'm very happy that all the opposition parties have uh, supported the government. Uh, we've worked well together and they agree to recall the House very quickly. There are a few mechanisms to put in place. It's going to take uh, the full bill that will have to be sent to the Speaker of the House. and. 48 hours after that, the House can be recalled. Thank you. I'm just going to ask Bill if he may have a point to add to your first question. Yeah, if, if, if I may, and I, I don't have a great deal to add, except I will assure you our officials are moving very rapidly to action the decision that was made today. Um, and, and we do expect, in, in very short order, it, it is reciprocal that those measures will be put in place. But I'd also like to make the point, I would very much urge Canadians and Americans to respect the principle behind the decision was made and avoid non-essential travel. We'll go to uh, CBC. Um, Dr. Tam, you know, you're in constant contact with your provincial counterparts on a daily basis. How many specifically, how many ventilators does Canada have and test kits? And how many do you estimate that we need? Well, right now, um, the... Um, Federal Provincial Territorial Table on looking at logistics is very much uh, meeting every single day. Um, certainly, the, um, we are actually um, preempting any need for ventilators by purchasing some already from the federal level, even though there hasn't been any specific uh, request necessarily for some of them. So we're trying to just preempt any need. Um, the um, in, in terms of the other supplies, uh, for example, we've secured um, 800,000 swabs just for test kits, for example. Um, as I've said, you know, Canada's already tested 50,000 people. Uh, 800,000 uh, swabs go some ways, but it doesn't mean we, we can stop. We just have to keep getting more. Um, you know, on an ongoing basis. So this is not a sort of a static uh, reality. But the reality is that there is global challenges in securing certain supplies and certain types of uh, personal protective equipment. What I do know is that of the personal protective equipment that is uh, needed by Canada, um, uh, we can currently uh, expect to um, meet those needs um, about at least 75% of the, the requested amount, but we're pulling all stops to look at any other supply, suppliers, bulk purchasing, um, and any other means. So, but I don't want to um, say that in, in, in Canada, we shouldn't be taking really good care of our supplies. We mustn't waste things. We've got to be really careful in the hospitals and how you actually use those supplies. And so uh, we're working really hard also to provide guidance to people uh, on the sort of stewardship uh, aspect. And I think Patty has something to add. I'll just add to that. Um, obviously, we're working uh, through Health Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, and with the uh, Minister of Procurement and her team to put in uh, large, large orders, because we know that even though the provinces and territories have indicated what they think they might need, in fact, we may need more. And I think Dr. Tam has been uh, clear and, and, and quite direct in saying that we are not the only country looking for these kinds of supplies. So we are also working with uh, the Minister of Innovation, Science, Economic Development, I think that's still his title, Minister Baines, uh, to make sure that we have a capacity within Canada to, uh, to, um, to, in some cases, help uh, factories and other manufacturers who maybe are not able to make the things that they sell right now, but can rapidly retool to make the things that we're going to need. So that work is happening right now. And the reason we can't give you exact numbers is because it is in the fluctuation period. As provinces are drawing down materials from our national stockpile, of course, we're trying to seek to replace those and, in fact, increase the amount that we need over and above what we may 
uh, eventually use. Um, I think this is the prudent measure to ensure that we can uh, have what we need, uh, ensure that we even perhaps buy more than what we need. But I will also say that manufacturers globally are trying to make sure that countries aren't stockpiling in a way that will actually prevent the ability of other countries to get what they need. So this is a global effort that is happening on procurement and on trying to coordinate what countries will need when they are seeing the sort of epidemic or the spike, if you will, of their particular curve hit. It's really important to remember that actually those global communities, those countries that don't have access to those kinds of supplies matter just as much, even though it might not seem so when you're in the middle of a crisis. Because in fact, if we can't actually think ahead to what countries that are going to be hit next will need, then if their infections increase, then that continues that wave of virus from circling the globe. And what we're trying to do is accelerate our supplies from a, an immediate urgent need, accelerate our work on the treatment for COVID-19, and accelerate our work on a vaccine. Because until we actually get all of those thing, three things working together, we could actually see a scenario where we would have the virus continue to circle the globe. And that's, that's the true challenge here. So we're working very closely, as, as Dr. Tam has said, with our provincial territorial partners, but also our international partners, to make sure that what we procure today, we have a capacity to, first of all, use, uh, and then possibly share down the line if we end up having more than we, what we need. And all of that evolves in real time. That's why it's so hard to give you precision around numbers. And I just want to underscore one thing that Patty has said, which is very important work being led by Minister Baines and Minister Anand, and which was discussed today uh, by the premiers in their call with me, uh, and is actually really inspiring which is Canadian manufacturers are putting up their hands and are stepping up and are looking at whether they have the capacity to retool and to produce here at home the things that we need. And that has really been uh, just a, an example for me of Canada coming together, Canada being united. They are being extremely creative. They are working with the provinces. They are working with us. We'll have more to tell you as these ideas and these efforts actually come to bear fruit. But it is a real example of a Team Canada approach. And I am very grateful to all the manufacturers who've been in touch with us, who have been in touch with their provincial leaders to say, you know what, I think I can make this stuff for our country. Restrictions. Um, President Trump said, quote, it's not pertaining at this moment to trade between the two countries. Could border measures affect trade and what could be the consequences? So it's a great question. And we a reason why we took the time that we needed to work this through carefully and cooperatively with our American neighbors was because we understand how essential that trading relationship is. And our American neighbors understand how essential that relationship is as well. So you heard from the president, you heard from the prime minister. We are absolutely clear that these border restrictions will in no way impede the trading relationship. They will in no way impede the essential trade happening between Canada and the United States every day. We understand on both sides of the border, the last thing the Canadian or U.S. economies need right now is another blow. So this is really about saying non-discretionary -discre travel shouldn't happen. If your trip is not essential, if it's for tourism or recreation, just don't take it. And there is tremendous clarity on both sides that trade needs to continue and essential workers need to continue to cross the border to do their jobs. And I want to really underscore one other thing, uh, which is, you know, this is a time when all countries in the world, as we heard from Dr. Tam, this is a global pandemic. Every country is really struggling with tremendous challenges at home. And in that struggle, I think that it is a very positive thing that Canada and the United States have managed to handle our border in this very collaborative and reciprocal way. And it says th something about the partnership that we have here in North America. I don't if Bill would like to add anything there. Do you have anything to add? 
I, I will also simply chair. Uh, we, I've, I'm having very regular conversations with my provincial counterparts. All of them have stressed the importance of maintaining those <clears throat> supply chains and economic activity that crosses back and forth between our borders. And they, they cite very specific examples. <clears throat> that, that observation really informed our discussion with, with our counterparts in the United States who also recognized its importance. It's, it's, it's important today. It's important every day. The, the food that goes on our shelves, the pharmaceuticals that we will require are all part of that international trade between our two countries. But it's also essential to maintain th those supplies to facilitate the economic recovery that will come. You know, many of our businesses and, and are, are suffering or going to suffer in, in, in the very difficult circumstances that we face in the near future. But it's also important to maintain uh, the, the economic conditions that will give rise to the, our recovery. And that was also very much a part of our discussion with our American colleagues and with our provincial partners across the country. Le Devoir. <clears throat> Minister Duclos, Duclos, my question goes to you. We've been talking about uh, EI measures or parallel measures. In a context where uh, pu uh, public officials are working from home, their children are not at school, what, uh, how confident are you of being able to uh, process so many applications? Thank you. We are putting unprecedented measures in place to ensure that all workers and families, as well as businesses, uh, are supported. And no one is being left behind in, with the measures that Minister Momo has announced, whether people are eligible for EI or not, whether it's people who need to be at home to take care of themselves, to take care of their families, their children, uh, who are not going to school, whether it be to take care of elderly parents, or because they have lost their jobs. Jobs. All these people, all workers and families are being supported, especially the most vulnerable among us. And uh, also before going to your question, when we're talking about vulnerable, we're also talking about very vulnerable people. And some of the measures announced today, uh, when you look at them, have uh, considerable support, provide considerable support to families who are having a great deal of difficulty right now. Here's an example of a lone parent woman with a mother with two children at home, and she has to be at home as well because she needs to take care of her children because they, they're they not at school or because she's lost her job. Well, that person would have already received about uh, $1,000 worth of uh, Canada child benefits, but with the measures announced this morning, she'll receive another $1,500. And in addition, she'll be protected because if she loses income for not being at work, well, then she, whether or not she's eligible for EI, she'll still be receiving about $450 per week for the next 15 weeks. So these are measures to tell Canadians that we're not that we're, uh, thinking of you. Now, uh, with regard to uh, the public service, we, are, we trust their ability to do uh, this work in these exceptional times because you know, we know that uh, government officials are also going through these problems uh, and they're aware of the major role that they're going to be playing uh, in future. So, for example, uh, computer services are being adapted, uh, directives are clear, uh, they must uh, take care of themselves and their families, they must telework wherever possible except in uh, exceptional circumstances. Uh, that uh, would require the security of the government. Follow up. Do you think you'll be able to pay out in two or three works, uh, three or two or three weeks? Because uh, when we're talking about EI sick leave, sometimes it takes months to receive the checks, and now there will be more people. So, what measures are you taking to ensure that this will be done quickly? Answer. There are a number of measures. First, uh, there have been improvements that uh, are being made to the EI system. Now, uh, those rather will not be made. We're going to focus on people who need our help more immediately. And a number of measures that were announced today, for example, uh, the uh, boosting of the GST credit uh, uh, and the uh, 
the emergency care benefit and the emergency support benefit. Those two benefits will be set up by the CRA, which has the ability to act uh, much more quickly and uh, effectively than Service Canada. Obviously, Service Canada has had trouble uh, processing demands very quickly, as we know, and uh, so Service Canada already has enough on its plate. So uh, that is why CRA will take over in some regards. Thank you. Questions on the phone? Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Our first question is from Mary Kay Walsh from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Hi there. My first question is for Minister Freeland, and then my follow up will be for Minister Haidu. Um, the first question is um, what President Trump said this morning. He said, at this moment, trade will continue. Can you please respond to that? Sure. Uh, let me be, you know, really clear and really reassuring. This has been a very positive, very collaborative conversation with our American neighbors. There was absolute agreement from the first sentence that was uttered that it is essential for Canada and the United States to continue to maintain the very important trade between our two countries. There, there, there was not even an atom, a molecule of pushback on that. It's what we said from the outset, and it is what our American partners said from the outset. We also heard in the context of these conversations, for example, in my conversation with Vice President Pence yesterday, uh, the real importance that he places on NAFTA, how delighted he is that Canada was able to ratify it. Was it just on Friday, Pablo? Uh, I I mentioned it to him, and he said, you didn't need to mention it to me, Christia. We noticed it right away. It's very important to us. It's a very important vote of confidence in the North American economy at this difficult time. So I would really see this agreement as a true vote of confidence by Canada and the United States in the importance of maintaining that essential trade at a very difficult time. And I also see it as an example of how we are able, at a really, really difficult time, to be good neighbors to each other. Uh, you know, one of the things, I, I don't think Vice President Pence will mind if I say that, He's, he said to me yesterday, look, the president is saying to everyone, it's time to stay put. We hear your prime minister saying to Canadians, now's the time to stay at home. And so we really see this as an extension of those very correct policies in both of our countries, where we're saying to people, now is the time to stay home. Now is the time to practice social distancing. And an extension of that, you know, we just heard Dr. Tam actually advise us, now is not the time to go visiting your neighbors. And that includes now is not the time to go visit your American neighbors or for our American neighbors. Now is not the time for them to come and visit us. Ça va. Uh, the question was audible for the interpreter. Answer. I want to underscore that it was a very positive and productive uh, conversation with Vice President Pence, with Secretary Pompeo, and the conversation that Bill uh, had with Secretary Wolf. There were a number of the very productive conversations that the Prime Minister has had with President Trump. We are in very close and effective collaboration with them. Everyone understands. We have already had arguments with Americans, that's true, but in this case, there are no arguments. We understand each other. We all understand the importance of uh, trade between our countries, and it is more important now than ever because, as Minister Molneau explained this morning, and as the Prime Minister explained as well, this is these are tough times, economically speaking, as well. So for us, by making this decision, by announcing this decision, 
We want to do two things. On the, on the one hand, to continue our policy of social distancing, that's very important, and at the same time, to reassure both Canadians and Americans that we understand the importance of trade between the two countries and that that trade will continue. Thank you. Okay, and I think the second part, Bill, do you have anything to add? And then, okay, and then the second part was for Patty. Okay, I think there was a follow up question from the Globe and Mail over the phone. <clears throat> I have a follow up question, yeah, for Minister Haidu. Um, my question is about essential workers who are terrified and contacting us, wondering if it's safe for them to still be operating in the trucking industry, for them to still be in construction sites, for them to still be in public works. What's your message to them? You're telling everybody to stay home, and yet you're also telling them to stay on the front line. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start, and then I'll actually turn to Dr. Tam, because I think the clarity around who needs to socially isolate and what that looks like is going to be different depending on the context of each person. First of all, I, I have to thank all of those workers that are on the front line that are serving in a variety of different ways and essential ways that keep our groceries stocked, our pharmacies uh, running, our, our uh, lights on, if you will, uh, and the goods moving back and forth. Uh, we know that we owe you all a debt of gratitude. But I will also say that uh, uh, there are precautions that people can take when they're working to make sure that they uh, themselves are not contracting the virus or unwittingly spreading it to other people. And I will say, Dr. Tam said something yesterday that was really important, and I think a way for all of us people that are healthy to think about this. Um, it is obviously we're all worried about catching the virus, but if you act like you already have it and that you're protecting the person next to you from getting it is a very useful way to think about it. Because the majority of us still, remember, will exhibit mild to medium symptoms. Most of us will not die of getting COVID-19. But what we're trying to do with social distancing is protecting the people in our lives from getting it. And so we can take precautions in our everyday life that we've repeated over and over. I will repeat them again just for good measure. We should wash our hands. We should definitely stay two meters away from one another in, uh, in, in uh, public spaces. We should stagger our working hours if we have the capacity to do that. We should for sure stay home when we're sick and let our employers know that we are unable to work when we're sick. That was part of the package today was to make sure that everybody can do that, regardless of their own personal benefits or insurance situations. And ultimately, at the end of the day, these measures will make sure that we protect those people that are counting on us. So I'll turn to Dr. Tam to speak a little bit more specifically about frontline workers and things they can do. Well, there's a lot that uh, every workplace can do to look at how to do the social distancing uh, without um, um, to the really impacting the critical work that they do. So, um, I mean, I, I'm most familiar, for example, with the healthcare sector. Of course, the healthcare sector is very, very important. So, you cannot just keep all healthcare workers at home. This is not possible. You actually need them working. So you institute specific things like screening at the front door of the hospital so that making sure that sick health care workers don't go to work, that they have um, the ability to remove themselves as soon as they have uh, signs of any illness, for example. Which is why, you know, obviously there are broad mm -hmm. messages for the public. But every workplace, every essential service, uh, have the ability to think through how you do social distancing and still maintain your business continuity and the incredible job that everybody is doing. Um, I do think that, you know, in some cases, people can do uh, telework, but in other cases, in construction, for example, no, you can't. But you might be in an open kind of space. You might be able to maintain a certain distance from others and absolutely wash your hands. And, and But uh, as the, the, the Minister of Health said, that the most important thing really, really is to not go to work when you're sick. This is not something that people um, are intuitive at doing uh, in North America, quite frankly. We just sort of just keep going and going and going, and that's not how you want to behave um, at this time. And, you know, if you are doing some incredibly important things like maintaining grocery stores open, everybody needs food. Either ways to practice uh, hygienic measures have, um, you know, um, have uh, alcohol, um, um, you know, hand sanitizers at the ready. Definitely wash your hands when you go home. 
uh, but it is some of those very basic uh, personal hygienic measures that you can use at work uh, to maintain your health and not spread to others. But maybe you're working with older people. Well, they, you need to take special precautions to protect them, long-term care facilities, but other uh, people who come in contact with others. Um, so, so I think that there's so many different ways. And, and I do think companies are actually really stepping up and looking at all sorts of innovative ways that uh, people can do things. Doctors actually doing more telemedicine. So you don't stop your general practice or family practice. You just do it in a different way. We'll go to the next question over the phone. Thank you. A following question is from Justin Ling, freelance. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, question is for the Deputy Prime Minister. I'm wondering if you're satisfied with the way in which the government has communicated to the country during this crisis. Um, obviously, press conferences have been late. Um, in some cases, details about travel, tra the travel advisories, travel bans have taken hours to get out to the public, and really, the government of Canada is not releasing a significant amount of data about the new transmissions. It's leaving that to the provinces. I'm wondering if you think changes need to be made going forward to sort of communicate more effectively with the media and the public. Um, look, uh, as uh, the Prime Minister always reminds us in Cabinet meetings, better is always possible. Uh, and I fully embrace and accept that. And uh, I also really uh, understand the absolute paramount importance of effective communication during this time. Uh, this is a time when First of all, things are changing and developing very, very fast. Uh, and this is a time when people are understandably anxious. And so it, people are absolutely right uh, to be demanding of our government that we communicate often and that we communicate effectively. Uh, the fact that we are here now every day uh, is part of our commitment to doing that. Uh, when it comes to communication that you're hearing at the federal level and at the provincial level, um, look, Canada is uh, not a highly centralized country, quite the contrary. And I really would like to salute and embrace and encourage the way in which provincial leaders, the premiers, uh, are doing a fantastic job and are being leaders in their provinces. That is something we support 100%. I had a very good call with the premiers this morning, and I said that to them directly. They are the frontline health care providers, and I think each one of them is doing a terrific job of taking that leadership. And you know, the federal government will never want to get in their way. We want to support and encourage them, and that is what we're seeking to do. At the same time, it's very important, because this is a global pandemic, it's very important for the provinces to understand and for Canadians to understand that we are not going to be quibbling about federal-provincial jurisdiction, that the federal government understands that we need to play a leadership role, and that's what we're doing including very much in health care. And that was one of the reasons for having the call with the premiers this morning was to hear directly from them. And I said to them, let's be sure we are communicating with each other. Tell me what you need and we will be here to provide it. And I know Patty does that with the provincial ministers very, very regularly. I would also like to salute the leadership which we are seeing from the mayors. I did a call yesterday with the big city mayors, and we are seeing a lot of mayors, all the mayors really, stepping up and doing what their municipalities need. That is a really good thing as well. One other thing I do want to say is all of us as Canadians need to get used to a situation in which things are changing and moving much more rapidly than we are accustomed to. This is a global pandemic, and the consequence of the very important measures we are taking to limit the spread of that pandemic in Canada 
mean that there is serious there are serious collateral economic impact which the prime minister and the finance minister addressed today dr tam shared with us yesterday an inspirational quote uh, from an irish doctor that she works with through the who who has said to us all you know choose speed over perfection and that is a great motto that is our motto. So what you're going to see from our government is a absolute acknowledgement. We are not perfect. What we can promise you is that we are going to act with the alacrity and the agility that this situation demands. It is going to sometimes mean that we make announcements to you of decisions that have been taken, important decisions that we think Canadians need to know about without being to, able to fill in all the details in the moment we make that announcement. That is the open and honest and effective way to operate and communicate in this situation. That's what we're going to do. Now, I see Patty wants to add something. Please. The Deputy Prime Minister and I are becoming uh, extremely intuitive about each other <laughs> through this process. I'll just agree uh, largely with the, with uh, well with the Deputy Prime Minister, and I will also say that since the beginning of the outbreak, as you know, we've been talking daily. Obviously, the situation evolves daily, and sometimes what we thought we knew about this brand new virus, with a whole bunch of new research and a whole bunch of new science that evolves every day, is not what we find out the next day, or there is new evidence, or there are new approaches to try, and so. So much like the Deputy Prime Minister has said, um, we have been uh, obviously working very, uh, very hard to make sure that we are, are responding to each new area and crisis that this virus presents itself. Uh, someone I am very close to the other day told me a bit of an analogy, and maybe I'll tell it to you. He said to me, you know, it's like an earthquake went off in Wuhan uh, all those months ago. And I looked back the other day about when I first talked to the press corps about the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID uh, outbreak. It was at the cabinet retreat in January, mid-January. At that time, we didn't really know what we were dealing with. We knew we had a new disease. We knew we didn't have an antidote. We knew we didn't have a virus. And we didn't really know what extent it would pose to the world health situation. And so we've been talking every day since then, and of course, so much has changed. I smiled a bit when one of my colleagues said, I think it was Deputy Prime Minister, said to Paulo, was that just on Friday? Because every day is feeling like it's a week. And I think it's that way for Canadians, too, as they're watching the news. We're going to be here with Canadians every step of the way. And we're going to take those hard decisions together, and we're going to figure out these really big challenges together, because no portfolio is unaffected. That big tsunami that got unleashed actually happens, and it, we've been watching it happen around the world, trying to prepare ourselves as a country, and it affects things that we can't even anticipate will affect in some ways. We've done a ton of scenario planning, but of course, each portfolio has a number of things that are implicated as you get to another stage of this particular situation we find ourselves in. So I want to thank Canadians for, uh, for being so supportive. I know there are lots of worries and lots of concerns and lots of back and forths, but no, I want also Canadians to know that we are obviously taking this extremely seriously, as you can see by the announcements day after day. And I want to thank the press corps as well, because you have been trying to keep up with a rapidly changing situation and providing Canadians information that's as accurate as it can be, as timely as it can be, uh, especially given the volume of information that's coming at you. And I know that you're working round the clock just as we are. And I think the service that you're providing to Canadians is exemplary. And I think the fact that so many of your outlets are making uh, your, uh, your news stories available uh, free without a paywall is critically important because we're all going to be able to uh, to do our things more effectively and to protect ourselves and our families more effectively if we have information that is evolving as rapidly as the changes. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, um, I'm, I wonder if you can tell me whether or not there actually is good uh, data communication uh, from the federal government to the provinces. After the SARS outbreak, uh, a report basically found there was no good centralized data collection uh, that we could share with other countries or provinces or cities or health authorities. And just really quickly for the House leader, uh, I'm wondering if you can tell me if there's any consideration of having Parliament uh, meet digitally over teleconferencing. Um, obviously, it kind of flies in the face of uh, the government's request for people to stay home if you're recalling MPs and senators back from across the country. 
Okay, that was actually two follow-up questions, Justin. We noticed. Um, so did your colleagues who are here. Um, and I think Dr. Tam will take the first, and then Pablo obviously will take the second. Yes, so um, I work with all the chief medical officers of health, and they've been extremely collaborative. Information is sent to us at the national level. Obviously, some of it is very detailed at the local level. That's not the kind of data that you send at the national level. At the national level, we um, maintain privacy and we get very critical uh, data elements, and that is absolutely happening. But you also have to remember that some of the public health investigations take a bit of time. So when you find a case and you want to look at contacts and you find out more about those contacts, and you investigate them, it's not that that is an instantaneous thing. I can tell you that chief medical officers actually was picking up the phone every time they found a new case to be, even in the middle of the night. That's how fast things work. Lab testing. We know when a lab test becomes positive, even if we didn't actually know anything about the patient that was actually linked to the positive test. And so that's been happening really in real time. So um, do we need more detailed data in order to look at in de more in-depth um, <laughs> Research, yes. I mean, again, that's through research funding. That's not necessarily surveillance or case reporting. There's a lot of those elements which is done through actual research studies, and those are also uh, ongoing as well. So all I could say is that we've had incredible collaboration. Okay, Pablo. Yes, well, I, um, to answer very directly, a teleconference for, for seating of parliament is not possible, definitely not now, maybe one day. But there are different ways to call back parliament. The one we're looking at is um, with a minimal number of MPs. Uh, we know that the, the quorum is, is 20, including the speaker. Maybe we could go to 25 or 30. Uh, we are actually, as we speak, our, the whips are discussing the different scenarios. So let's say we bring back 25 uh, MPs that reflect the proportion of the House. It's a mirror of the House, and we take MPs that don't have to travel by plane. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the last question over the phone. Thank you. The following question is from Melanie Markey de La Presse. La prochaine question is de Melanie Markey de Next La Presse. Next question from Melanie Markey de La Presse. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin with a special request that would be to try and show up on time for press conferences, because since many journalists are working from home, it's difficult to get uh, telephone lines. My question, the first one, goes to Ms. Freeland concerning the border closure. We were talking about a 30-day period. Could you tell us about snowbirds? There will be many of them coming home. So imagine that a snowboard gets to the border with COVID-19 symptoms. Where will those people be put in quarantine? Will they stay in the United States or will they be allowed into Canada? Thank you. Concerning the uh, period for which we made a decision, I would just start by pointing out that uh, this is a temporary situation. And the Prime Minister and the President were very clear between themselves that this is a temporary situation. As concerns for how long this will be the case, Canada's proposal was to put this in place for 30 days, but after that, to uh, review that. So perhaps during our press conference, uh, this has been confirmed. And if it was confirmed by the president, then so much the better. As concerns snowbirds, that is a personal decision. But I would like to reassure all Canadians that Canadian residents will always have the right to come home. And all Canadians have been told by the prime minister that now is the time to come back home. 
to come back to Canada. And perhaps uh, Dr. New might want to add something? Yes. Concerning the snowbirds, the snowbirds, there are two aspects. For Canadians abroad, there is screening done if someone is uh, symptomatic and doesn't want to take a flight. While there are measures for the government to support Canadians abroad, what happens at the border, well, there is the Quarantine Act, and what happens with our border officers is that uh, the person will be tested if they need medical follow-up, then that person will be placed under the Quarantine Act and will be followed up as necessary. Yes, but will that person be quarantined in Canada? Yes, yes. Okay. Mr. Minister Rodriguez, uh, you might have been watching news reports in Quebec. We have heard Quebecers say, well, listen, COVID-19, I think it's just like a flu, and so I'm going to continue to go to Cuba and get a tan. What do you tell those people who are making that decision? Because they are jeopardizing the health and safety of many citizens. Answer, what we're telling them is to listen and to follow public health directives. Uh, the Quebec government is doing an excellent job and has been very clear on that. People are being asked to stop any travel that is not that is non-essential, especially for personal or recreational or tourism reasons, because uh, this uh, crisis will depend on the individual gestures that people make. Thank you. Merci. As director of immunization, you had signed off on a on a master plan, preparedness plan for pandemics. You recall it well. It had estimates with all the normal cautions. All right, this is uh, the end uh, of a long press conference with uh, cabinet ministers and Canada's chief public health officer on an important day with two significant developments. First of all, the announcement that there will be the temporary closing of the Canada-U.S. border, although we don't know exactly when. And the second, that significant economic measures uh, will be brought in over the next few weeks, $27 billion in direct spending and uh, other uh, tax deferral measures. David Cochran has been watching all of this with me. Uh, David. Uh, let, maybe let's just start with the border, because I do know Donald Trump spoke about it as well, saying, uh, it, I guess we don't exactly know when this is going to start, from what we mm -hmm. heard from our deputy prime minister. Yeah, it seems to be skewing towards the end of this week. I think they wanted to get the message out there very clearly and signal to people. And we heard from the deputy prime minister that, look, we're going to be making announcements in these times that we're not going to have all of the details ironed out yeah. on, because that's just the way the world is right now. So to summarize, the border is closing at a certain point to all non-essential travel. There's $82 billion in direct payments to people and money to stabilize the economy. And some health news, uh, Ro uh, Rosie, two new tests have been approved to expand testing in Canada. That will certainly help with identifying where the virus is, who has it, but expect a spike in numbers because of that. They've ordered 800,000 and stockpiled swabs to help with the testing. Mm -hmm. They have about 75% of the personal protective equipment they need for the healthcare system with plans to order more. And a yep. Really critical thing, industry is retooling to start building things like ventilators, converting factories and machine shops towards medical equipment. So this is the whole of country response to back up that whole of government response. Okay, David, thanks for your help throughout this. And uh, my thanks as well to Vashi Capellas. You can watch David later on The National. And Vashi will have full coverage on her show, Power and Politics, starting at 5 Eastern. A reminder then that the border will temporarily close to uh, non-essential travel, perhaps as early as this Friday. President Trump suggesting it could last as much as 30 days. And those measures to try and get money directly into your pockets still have to be passed by Parliament. They say that could take a number of weeks. This has been a CBC News special report. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thank you for watching. Coverage continues on CBC News Network.